we mentioned um, Dwayne Carnegie, who has over seven years of experience working full-time in the animation industry in Canada. Uh, Wayne Carnegie is a seasoned professional artist. Though trained to be a generalist, Mr. Carnegie has been working on numerous animated productions as a senior shading art, texture artist, uh, films such as Troll Hunters, Troll Hunters, and the Rainbow Kingdom, Spark, A Space Tale, Rusty Rivets, and Barbie and her sister in the Great Puppy Adventure, just to name a few of the productions that um, he has worked on. And for personal projects, Wayne also illustrates children's books filled with stories inspired by his childhood growing up in Clarendon, Jamaica. Right, so that is Wayne. And now we move on to, who do I have next on the board? Kathy, Kathy Kareem. She's a winner of the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival, Caribbean Film Mart, Best Pitch Prize, and the Caribbean Tales Incubator Big Pitch Award. Kathy Kareem is a filmmaker and a musician whose career spans film, television, interactive media, and academia. Born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago, she's also a proud Jamaican descendant whose work has been featured in the Kingston Animation Festival. When it comes to video entertainment, some of the more recognizable corporations she has worked with include PBS, Disney, and Pluto TV. Having served as a research fellow at American University's Center for Social Impact Media, Kathy has expertise in using media to strategically achieve positive change in society. All right, and that is, you know, hopefully one of the things that we're going to bring out in today's talk. You know. Right? Um, so we have Coretta Singer, or Swiss Jamaican, multi-award winning 3D modeler, VFX and digital artist with 15 plus years of experience working on local, regional and international commercial commercials and movies, 3D character modeling for short films and commercials, as well as 2D concept art and animation. Some commercial clients that include Digicel, Flow, Grace Kennedy, Red Stripe and Nestle International worked alongside production houses such as, as Cinecom and ad agencies such as OGM, CGR, and Prism, to name a few. A uh, meticulous problem solver and explorer of new ideas, techniques, and technologies, her local, regional, and international animation connections, insights, and experience have allowed her to be part of the Jamaican government delegations to South Korea, France, and the US. So. You know, I feel small after reading all of these bios. <laughs> <laughs> but that is our lovely um, cast of panelists. Don't forget Kevin. Kevin. Oh, and Kevin Wall, yes. Where is the... <clears throat> Kevin's own is... I think his own is going to be the longest. <laughs> this man is a man of many achievements. Many achievements. <laughs> oh, you don't have to... Kevin <clears throat> What was that? What was that, Kevin? Oh, no, well, we can't read Never that. Mind, yeah, so Kevin Wallen, despite facing acute economic hardships during his childhood in Jamaica and troubled years marred by anger and depression as a teenager in Canada, Kevin Wallen rose above his life's challenges and went on to become a successful motivational speaker, philanthropist, and entrepreneur. He has utilized his own negative experiences to connect with disenfranchised individuals and assist them to see and fulfill their own potential. Kevin points to the power of mentorship in aiding him to overcome the obstacles in his own life and sees it as a pivotal component in motivating others to take control of their circumstances and make the best opportunities presented to them. And upon completion of his bachelor's degree, Kevin conducted seminars to motivate and inspire high school and university students across the globe. Kevin is an extraordinary transformational coach and motivational speaker. He has spoken in over 150 schools in Canada, primarily in the Peel and Toronto school district. He has been the keynote speaker for graduations and wellness seminars for, the university, for universities, high schools, and corporate entities in Jamaica. He's a firm believer in the restorative justice and upon his return to Jamaica founded the NGO said students sorry set which stands for students expressing truth uh, through his organization he has spearheaded extensive rehabilitation programs which within three of the Jamaican penal institutions and 
Kevin Wallen established fully equipped computer labs and provided training sessions and life skills development for inmates. This initiative saw establishment of the first radio station in the general penitentiary. He has also done transformational work with gangs in troubled communities. And uh, um, Kevin, just checking, you're still president of the Jamaica Wrestling Federation? No, I'm just uh, a happy, uh, how would you say, supporter. Okay, okay. I was just checking because I saw I saw in the bio that you're president, but I know you had, had stepped down. No, I had stepped um, down. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So since wrestling played such an important role in swaying him from adopting a destructive lifestyle, he hopes to establish the sport as an extracurricular activity in schools throughout the country and utilize it as a tool to address behavioral problems that are prevalent in the island's educational system and widely acknowledged as a premier authority on behavioral rehabilitation, especially among marginalized men. Kevin has been called upon as a consultant for Jamaica's Department of Correctional Services and USAID. He's a Harvard fellow with the Berkman Center for Internet and, yeah, Internet and Society in celebration of his hard work and tremendous achievements. Kevin was recognized with the American Chamber of Commerce, Commerce's Jamaica 2010 AmCham Award for Excellence and Civic Leadership. So you see what I mean when I said he's a man of many accomplishments. And he used to be my wrestling coach. And believe me, uh, the, the, this guy, you know, super talented. I think you 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 even went back and competed in your your fifties, right? Uh, taking out younger guys than you. Uh, forty eight. I also, went to the Commonwealth Games at age. It was forty eight. Yeah. You're at Commonwealth Games at age forty eight. So you know you can't mess with Kevin. <laughs> can tell you that. Yep, that is it. I need to unmute so that we don't get the echo. It's just taking a while. Okay, here we go. <laughs> My mic is back. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to know for the session to Kevin, who is going to moderate the talk between Kathy, um, Wayne, and Coretta on the lead in mail. All right, take it over, Kevin Wallen, because we have more than one Kevin here. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much um, <clears throat> for having me. When I first got the invitation, I was saying, like, well, I'm not an animator. Why would I be, you know, in this kind of gathering? And then the more I, I thought about it and then the more I heard about what it is that you guys are up to, it makes more sense to me um, what I could contribute to this afternoon. Um, before I get into the conversation with, you know, um, the panel this evening, I want to ask you guys a question. Are you guys by any chance familiar with Tupac Shakur's early interview? He was 17 years old when he did that interview. I, I would have to say no. I don't think I know that one. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. I think especially for a conversation like this, it, it, it's, it's such an important um, video to watch because the interview that he gave at 17 um, and then afterwards he played that movie role where he was like... He was the, the rough and the, the tough guy. And he literally took on the personality of the of the movie character because that was the only representation of the strong male representation he had. Everything else, and if you watch the interview and you listen to the interview, everything else was about his mother. He mirrored himself almost completely. And after the movie came out, it was at that point in time that you could see like a different image. So in preparation for today's conversation, I, um, I watched, I watched, um, I just watched a few things, you know, um, especially with men that are considered, you know, strong and in the public eye, you know, and I just kind of tried to do a little bit of research on them. And the ones that were single come, came from single family homes, um, the ones that came from a home with a mom and dad, there was clear distinction 
um, between them in terms of how it is that they operated and conducted themselves. So one of the things that I'd, I'd like to ask, you know, the guests as we go in um, to the conversation today, what was your home life situation like and how did that, you know, gear you towards the kind of characters that you, you know, um, in a sense want to, to see in your productions? Can we start with Wayne? Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Moderator and um, John, uh, presidents and stuff. And uh, good to be here. Uh, it's a very good question. And um, like I, I could say, like growing up in Jamaica, like I grew up in Jamaica for most of my life. And I grew up with my grandmother in the country, Clarendon, the, the bush. Uh, up, up, up by Kellex, up by Kellex area, um, just between the border of um, Clarendon and Saint Anne. And and um, why I wanted to illustrate the the area, I just want to like kind of give you a, a surrounding of a little picture there where I I was I was sent I was actually sent by my mom because uh, my grandmother was alone there. She bought a piece of land, and um, she, my grand, my mom had like a lot of lot of boys, so she's like, "Send we in," and uh, that's how I ended up in Clarendon. And at first, I didn't want to go, but uh, at first, I didn't want to go. But like as I go there, there wasn't any TV, uh, there wasn't any um, like nightlife, like like in Spanish Town, like like when I was in Spanish Town. Uh, there wasn't any of that. There was, um, we had like an old radio with like a makeshift wire antenna where we would listen to cricket, um, um, night talk show. And like, I mean, me as like a seven year old, I'm listening to Winston Witter and all those kind of guys on the radio. And um, like, I develop a, what I'm trying to get at is I, I develop a lot of listening skills and um, TV. Uh, um, you know, just get grandmothers, uh, I get my grandmother's uh, stories. And um, I would say, um, I didn't, and then I, I just, my grandmother used to give me the, the newspaper clippings with the cartoons, and I started reading them just for reading purposes. But I not only read them, I actually started drawing them and tracing them. And that was a source of inspiration for me, along with the stories that my grandmother told me. So, um, at that time, my grandmother was married and everything. Um, so um, I I had like a a grandfather figure around me in a time, but but the whole community and everything, um, I think it definitely influenced my artwork and and everything in my imagination and the, the, just the whole isolation kind of it kind of it, it plays a big part it, it, big part with me. Um, in addition to that, the community where I grew up was like, you know, people used to share, like it's like a verb, it's like, like there's a lot of storytellers, like people, uh, we like in the evenings, we didn't have TV, so like people will gather around our, in our yard, roast corn and, you know, talk about oh, the stories and so forth. So, uh, but yeah, so uh, just like a short thing, I mean, I have, I have a long story, if you guys have like time, I'll like, tell you the story. But that, I think that helped uh shape the kind of story that I'm, I'm actually trying to push out today uh especially with my starboy project um yeah I'll, I'll leave the floor for somebody else to um add their add their story thank you awesome thank you correct maybe we'll go with you on that same question hi everyone um all right uh for me I, I, like i said at the beginning um um like was said I was born in Switzerland. I came to Jamaica. I was about five years old um, when I came in, and most of my my brought up, say I suppose, has been here in Jamaica with my mom. My dad was still in Switzerland, so my mom and dad had split up at that point. And it was it was interesting coming from another country, coming to Jamaica, and then trying to sort of navigate that space as as an alien almost. 
and uh, growing up with my grandparents it was uh, very interesting. They, my grandfather at the time was a deputy Comm commissioner of police, so there was a very interesting, yeah, very interestingly, uh, it was a very interesting uh, growing up environment, very strict, um, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, and then he went, and strangely enough, then he sort of became a pastor. What a strange thing to switch to. <laughs> So it was growing up with my grandparents and my mom and, you know, trying to navigate, um, you know, growing up in Jamaica and how different it was to my life in Switzerland. And I think that, you know, mirrors itself a lot in the stories that I tend to write, the whole idea of feeling like an outsider and that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's just a brief sort of thing. I'm not going to go into too much more. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Kathy. Yeah, hi everyone. Hi. So, um, I think uh, Tupac's experience, like um, oftentimes in, in urban environments in the U.S., when you're when you're in an environment where you have a single mother, um, it can be a really sort of isolating family unit. However, since I grew up in the West Indies. I have the shared experience with Tupac that I had a single mother. However, it was a completely different experience because I think that our culture was a lot more um, into the it takes a village kind of approach to raising kids as opposed to, um, you know, me having grown up isolated with just my mother to look at. So I grew up in a house with my um, maternal grandfather and grandmother and um, on my father's side, my my grandparents were also really involved. So my grandfather and uh, grandmother on my father's side were really involved in my life. My uncles were really involved in my life or my aunts. Um, and so um, in terms of how uh, growing up in my family unit would have shaped my art, um, I definitely have very distinct memories from, you know, all of the the people who would have been parental figures in my life, including my grandfathers. And definitely my current project is directly inspired by my grandfather. Um, and if I, you know, if I look closely, I'm sure I can see all of the male and female influences in my life, in my work. Um, but definitely most tangibly in my most recent project, the Caddy Club, um, my grandfather was an active golfer and he always dragged me onto the golf course with him because, you know, it was an exciting thing for him to be able to teach his granddaughter a sport that he loved. And so um, the themes of golf that ended up in the caddy club are definitely inspired by my grandfather. Awesome. <clears throat> it's amazing, but all three of you um, grew up with your grandparents. So that's um, that's a, it's a, well it's it's quite a thing in in uh, in the Caribbean context more so from my understanding in the Jamaican context. But one more question: so how how would you describe your style? I should just clarify: my mom was in the house with my grandparents as well, so I lived with my oh, mom. Oh, your mom was there as well. Okay. We all lived we all lived in a house with my grandparents, so everybody was there. <laughs> Awesome. I, I would recommend um, that you guys just for conversation sake or just for whatever, just watch that, watch a Tupac interview and see how it is that it hits you just from who he was in that interview and who he, who he appeared to be after he played the role. In the interview, he reflected so much of his mom. Um, everything about his style, everything about what matters to him, everything about what's important in terms of what it is that he learned about life and all that kind of stuff. Everything was attributed back to his mom. And there was not that male um, influence until after that movie came out and the response that he got for the role that he played, he kind of morphed more into that role as opposed to you know, what he was prior to playing the role but very, um, very strange. So what it is that I'd like to uh, 
to get from each of you now is just kind of like an overview as to um, the production that you're working on and the male the, your male leading character. Um, yeah, so thank you again. Um, uh, the story that I'm working on, working on right now is um, it's a kind of a diaspora, diaspora um, story, meaning um, the main character was about, like born in England and um, um, he like he was also sent to Jamaica um, to stay with grandma uh, that kind of thing so it's kind of like my story really but I put like a twist my like my, my real life story inspired it so I put like a twist with Starboy here and um, and long story short it's this character um, you know didn't want to go to Jamaica at first but when he came here, um he learned a lot about his roots his jamaican roots and so forth uh which uh you know people think back to i have a daughter right now and she's born in canada and um you know it's kind of like a self-discovery about his jamaican roots um that's 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 what my my story about my story is about regarding the star boy um, so like he's gonna come back to Jamaica, didn't like it, but he meet like different people, um, like is you know in the small community, learn like some like I, I remember when I was growing up in Clarion, I worked, I learned so many skills to make my own toys, make my gigs, uh, my slingshots, and uh, those were my toys, like toys from like recycled materials, um, stuff like that. So um, you know um, and 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 what um well how i learned this i learned this from a older boy how to do this work because I'm, I'm coming from spanish so i don't know i don't know all these things so like like i, I like star boy now in, in in this scenario he's gonna be learning to do these things uh the jamaican style from a girl from a girl character so uh who, who's a smarty fan so uh, so she's gonna be like she, she talks less but you know she's really a genius and you know starboy give her the plan she you know calculates and you know make the, the you know the, the the box truck or the the wooden cards and stuff like that you know and um yeah so so that's that's all that's a little bit about starboy he's a diaspora kid as the same and he's a, he's trying to he you know try to um be, you know, like learn about his Jamaican roots. Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. So yeah. who's who's your audience? My audience is like kids from like Jamaica. My, my audience is kids from Jamaica and like just around the world who's, who, you know, because, you, you know, like, yeah, there's people in Jamaica, but there's like a lot of kids who are born by Jamaican or Caribbean parents that's abroad and they don't know much about the island or the culture or anything, you know, um, just, uh, you know, like sometimes they probably they don't have um, parents who are in touch with their roots either. So um, I, I think that's my target audience is actually, you know, um, to show, you know, to show, to show Jamaican kids that they're also kids that are of Jamaican descent outside the island, um, you know, and, you know, like for example, I'm just going up a little bit of topic. Like, like for example, for example, the reggae boys right now, uh, a lot of the players are of Jamaican roots that are born in England and stuff like that. And uh, like, I, I mean, I, I've been a sports forum where people are saying, "Oh, they're not really Jamaican, but, but like they're Jamaican kids." So, I uh, and then oh yeah, like another big thing about Starboy, he's a he's an avid uh, football player. So. That's one of his things. He's gonna to come to Jamaica and say, "Oh, this is how you guys play football here," you know, and stuff like. That. Yeah. So, so yeah. My, going back to that, my target audience is like Jamaican kids and Jamaican diaspora. Yeah, that's, those are my target audience. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds sounds awesome. So the last question that I'll ask you is. Um, can just give me one of those moments like in creating the character or creating this production that stood out for you? Well, um, as I said, this this little character um, is based on a, a lot about my childhood, you know, and 
a little bit of my, my lifestyle inspired by my um my my daughter a little bit too that that you know mm-hmm. being born in Canada for her um and uh the, the whole creation process is just and also like if like the the character is on the flyer if you look at him uh the way how he's designed is kind of like my illustration style and i have other realistic style that i um i kind of don't want to go so hyper real i just want to keep it kind of like uh the diary diary of a wimpy kid is is very (laughs) inspired by the diary of a wimpy kid with the the spaghetti arms and and and, uh and um like the the like in, in in his in his design like his like in the 3D model, his mouth isn't really like like a 3D model mouth. It's like a 2D um, kind of facial setup for him. Just just a little bit of technicality there. Uh, so those are like one of my big highlights. Just to stick to my style. Uh, here here he is <laughs> on the screen. There I try to do some. Right now I'm just doing like some little animation loops. Put it out there online. Trying to get um, people to like it, share it, uh, get the name out there. But in the background, I'm actually working on getting some brands here in Canada to produce, okay. to actually pay. I'm actually, well, I actually want to pay people who are involved in the production. Um, I, I kind of don't, I don't like especially, I, and also like who helped me work on this film is Jamaican talent, Caribbean talent. I kind of want to make it that too. Um, like for example, the character model for this character is called Dion Coke. The animator is Tony and Johnson on this here, and I was responsible for um, texture and set up the rig and the original concept for it. So, um, kind of want to put my whole drive here is to put Jamaican, you know, give the youth them a, a run, you know, give the youth yeah. a chance um, to to show, and not only. And not only just ask them for free work, but actually give them a thing, you know, as Jamaica would say, give them a pay. Uh, so they could, you Absolutely. know, you know encouragement sweetens labor, as grandma would say. So um, try to work on some funding for that to, to get, to actually make a short film. But for, the, but for right now, I'm just um, dropping these loops online, TikTok and, and Instagram and YouTube so far. Yeah. Awesome. 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 It looks great. That character looks, uh, <laughs> looks, it's a catchy one. It looks pretty good. And the colors. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, like an outfit right now. The, 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 the Gold Cup is going on. So I'm trying to get some of the Gold Cup crowd, you know, he's cheering for Jamaica. So I'm trying to yeah. put it out there. Yeah. Thank you. And the name is right on. Starboy. <laughs> right on. Starboy. Starboy. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Bridget, respect. Thank you for that overview. Um, Coretta, I want to come to you and I want to ask you the same thing. Just provide us with an overview of your production and its uh, male lead and character. Awesome, Sauce. Um, yeah, so mine is a feature film. Um, the, the story is basically a West Indian fairy tale about a forest monster, sort of guardian, sort of a character who befriends a little girl. And the whole thing with him, his story is that he's seeking redemption for a past where he's done some not so fantastic things. And now he's trying to like uh, make up for all those um, wrong things that he's done. And I guess the whole interaction of him and the little girl is that he starts to mm-hmm. see humans in a different light so before that he was like all about keeping humans out of the forest so he hates them um and that interaction though sort of changes um his view of things and his view of how he should go forward and i think one of the interesting things for me with this character is also utilizing him in a way to focus on men's issues in terms of like having this character who's very supposed to be strong and you know the one that everybody looks up to but then realizing he's actually struggling and Mm -hmm. during his whole story it's about you know also creating an environment uh with the people around him that creates a safe space for him to be more open about his feelings and what he's what he's going through okay what makes this important to you 
Um, it's just this hearing, uh, just hanging around a lot of like male figures, like um, my my male friends, uh, just people in general, hearing these kinds of conversations and realizing that there are issues that men face, especially Caribbean men, black men, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know they're not really given a safe space to talk. And I'm like, you know, here's the opportunity to create a character that can you know, bring this to the fore and kind of say, hey, look, you know, guys, it's okay to talk. It's okay to come out and not just talk just to women, but also between each other, which I think is very, very important. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And I think um, oftentimes there's a tendency to think that, you know, the feminine energy does not necessarily understand that the masculine energy, you know, also needs, right. you know, that, um, that space. Right. you know where they can you know kind of take it off and just be vulnerable if you will right yeah so it's always um so in terms of the character in terms of the size difference and all that kind of stuff is that a part of you know the imagery that you want to project um yeah i mean he's supposed to be this big scary sort of dude like you know and, yeah um you know but the, here's this little girl that kind of sees him uh, sees the good in him and sees the things that he's he would be you know um, capable of and you know encourages him to sort of focus on the positive aspects that he sort of keeps buried inside um, and, and so yeah you know he's he's just kind of this you know monster ogre dude and um, yeah and so I'll ask you the the same question I asked Wayne um, who's right. your audience for this. Um, it's kids. It's, I wanted to have it more be a global audience. So it's mostly kids going to preteens. Um, more global audience. It's about bringing um, Caribbean stories and folklore to a wider audience, to the, the greater world. And just sort of using this film as a vehicle to do so. And I, you know, I kind of push into a more Disney esque style, but not quite. Disney. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, this, this is the. Uh, I'm just seeing the. Uh, this is my proof of concept that I did like quite some time ago. So, just the other day. Yeah, just just the, yeah, just the other day. Chevrolet says in, slyly in the corner, but no, um, I've I've developed the characters quite a bit since then. The character designs have changed quite a bit, um, but I want to push for a style that's a little bit more globally recognizable to sort of bring this story to the world. It's um, it's a good look. Many facts. It's good looking. <laughs> so, in um, in terms of like even growing up, I have a son, and coming through, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen the Lion King. Can't tell you the amount of times I've seen all of these, you know, um, Ice Age and over and over. He just watches the same things over and over. So I found that each time I watch these movies with him as an adult, I got a tremendous amount out of it. So how much of, of this is meant also for the, um, the adults who may just be sitting there watching with the, the, um, the youngster? I, I think that's the very interesting thing about animation is that it's, it's, if, if it's well, well written enough, you know, it's yes, your target audience is kids, but you know, your your parents are going to come hopefully with you to the theater, and there's going to be stuff for them to pick up, uh, and that's a very very interesting thing. Things that I love about animation and animated film is that, sure, you know, there's always the there's the, the main target audience, but there's the little jokes and the little things that are put in that the older people will pick up, or and even when you watch these films again later as a grown up person, you start to pick up on things like, wait, I didn't realize that's what they were talking about back right. then in, in this movie. And it's, it's a, you know, you can have it just kind of grow with you, you know, and that's where the writing part kind of comes in. So in terms of just like sitting back and looking at the whole thing now that you're here, you have, right. you're this, you're at this point. Um, what was that thing that when you got through it, you were just like, okay, now we're, 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 we're getting somewhere. What um, was your breakthrough moment as you put this project together? Uh, that, that's, a very, that's a very tough question because I, I would say that I did a proof of concept, which is about, I would say it's about nine minutes long. So 
the actual feature length film is still something that is in pre-development at this point. Okay. But I think that I have, we had a whole push for animation here in, in Jamaica with um, Yadai and all of these initiatives to push animation as an industry in Jamaica. And as such, this project got workshopped quite a bit and I got a lot of good feedback and a lot of, well, maybe conflicting feedback um, while I was working on this. And I feel like at the end of everything, I, I ended up with something that I wasn't quite as in love with as I was in the very beginning, because a lot of the initial themes and a lot of the initial beats of the story kind of got taken out. And I was like, as I sort of sat with it afterwards, especially during the pandemic when, you know, we had so much time to do things and just <laughs> work on our projects, I started to focus back on what was it about this story that really resonated with me? What are the themes that I wanted to push? And I said to myself, you know, I want to take some of the feedback that I got from all of these workshops and working with people who have written for uh, like SpongeBob and people from the, like Disney executives that have come down and given feedback and stuff like that. What, how can I take that information and tie it to what I had originally and, and hit a nice sort of sweet spot in the middle? Um, and, I, and again, it's just kind of in sitting with that, it's, it's realizing how I can utilize this character to bring attention to the issues that men face in the Caribbean. Why is that important to you? Again, it's it's just it's just listening to my male friends. It's listening. It's it's also in realizing that I had the opportunity to reconnect with my father like in two thousand and four, I believe. So and and in re reconnecting with my father, realizing you know the kind of person he was. Um, versus the kind of person I suppose I was made to think he was. And I was like, you know, I feel like this, there's a lot about his personality that I'd like to bring across through this character. Okay. Understood. Awesome. Awesome looking project. Thank you. So I'll come back. I'll come back to you in a minute. Kafi, I'll come to you with the same the same vibration at the top, provide me just like with an, in, an overview of your project, you know, and um, the leading character that you chose. So the Caddy Club is about five kids in a vacation golf camp who unexpectedly get superpowers when they discover a magical portal. So it's an ensemble cast. Um, that come together to make a superhero team called the Caddy Club. And so this team of five kids includes uh, three boys who, um, you know, are part of the team. And so, um, yeah. Awesome. So what are the adventures like? What's the, the main um, thread that runs through? What are they trying to accomplish? Yeah, so... Um, the way the story goes is um, the three boys actually end up in the vacation golf camp because they get into trouble with the police officer over their August vacation. So they're having fun. Um, one of them is gang affiliated and just at the wrong time, a police officer sees them when they are holding a weapon. And so um, Ryan, Akil, and Jamal are the names of the boys. And Ryan is the one who's gang affiliated. Akil and Jamal just happen to be hanging out with him when this incident goes down with the police officer. But they meet with the police officer who doesn't really believe in youth detention center if it's avoidable. He's like, I'm not sending y'all to some place where they're gonna like, you know, be super punitive over, over an incident that I think can be treated a little bit more mildly. So what he does instead is he heard about this uh, golf camp and he's like, you know what? I'm sending you guys there. You're going to go learn how to play golf, stay off the streets, stay out of trouble. And um, little do they know that instead of just learning boring golf, they end up getting superpowers. 
Um, and so they get these superpowers and then they team up with uh, Keisha and Tamika to save other kids from being recruited into gangs. Um, and that's that's the thread of the whole story. Awesome. So why did you choose this particular theme? Um, I think it is, um, it's a story that's been brewing in me for a while. Since about 2010, I started writing a different version of this story, which was live action. It was a live action version of this story that was a little bit more like uh, dark and more like a young uh, coming of age story. Um, and it's the story stuck with me. And even though I revised it, I wanted to keep those themes of, um, of, of sort of, uh, you know, some of the crises that I see in our environment. So I, I had mentioned my grandfather earlier and uh, he, he taught golf on a golf course in Trinidad called the Shagaramas Golf Course. So where the Shagaramas Golf Course is located, it's really close to um, this area called Caranage and Scorpion, which is an area that is, um, especially back in the day, more economically disenfranchised than the area where the golf course is in itself, right? So it's like you have mm, the golf course, gotcha. which exactly, which attracts like, you know, of course, you, as you know, golf courses tend to attract people who have, um, you know, in that middle class and above uh, uh, group economically. But right, in order to get to the golf course, of course, you pass through this neighborhood and these neighborhoods that are more economically disenfranchised. So grandpa worked with a lot of um, youth from those neighborhoods taught them how to caddy, taught them how to golf, and ended up, you know, giving them opportunities to tour the world playing golf. Like he discovered a lot of talent through his work with youth. So as a high schooler, I would have been seeing that. I would have been, you know, witnessing mm -hmm. um, the fact that he was exposing people who may not have been exposed to um, golf or the opportunity to travel and all this kind of stuff to he was opening up opportunities through his work right and then i myself um through all the different things that i've done um as a musician and just in my life i have also made a lot of relationships with people from a lot of different backgrounds um and so you know i have when i was a, a teenager some of my best friends were um from the ghetto even though that was mm -hmm. my my experience right Right. And so I was very close and intimate to the to the, um, the the clash, the economic clashes, and also to I was very close and intimate to be able to see the way that our different experiences would have shaped us, but also to see that at the at the core we were very much just the same in terms of people, human beings who wanted to aspire to be the best, and just ha happened to have different. So I was able to very, very, be very close to that, that, um, that truth that no matter where you come from, no matter what your upbringing is, we at the core have, have more in common than we do um, different, even if we have different opportunities because of, you know, um, our economic circumstances. So all of this, you know, is just part of my experience, my life experience. And so, um, you know, I'm also like a big reggae fan. And so I always have that those themes of, um, of, you know, economic empowerment and social justice running through my spirit. And so I think it was just a natural sort of culmination of all of my experiences to make a movie that was about, um, sh about youth making a brighter way for all of us. So I, I see where, um, where all you guys have this thing from your childhood that kind of comes through, you know, the relationship with your grandpa clearly shows up, you know, um, in this film here. But what is, is there something like that's going on right now in the world that is of concern to you or something that you feel like you need to lend your voice to and you do it through this medium? Maybe not outright, you know, blasting it out there but you kind of try to just feed it through through what it is that you're doing with your um with your work yeah absolutely absolutely so um for 
from back in the day until now, there has been, um, you know, a, a, a very, what am I trying to say? In, from, from my view, in, um, in Black communities across the world, um, we have been experiencing the negative consequences of gun violence. We have been experiencing the negative consequences of the um, uh, like the harsh drug trades, like cocaine and stuff. We have been still experiencing the negative consequences of uh, economic disenfranchisement that would have started all the way back from slavery. We're still a very disenfranchised community where we, we have less access to resources. And it affects our, our youth who are um, being criminalized at, at young ages and, um, and, and being put in survival situations at very young ages. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I would have worked on my uh, my former project, Big Man Dan. I would have worked with somebody who works in national security and who himself does a lot of work in, in gang prevention. And he would have given me a statistic that stuck with me, which was that um, gang recruitment starts as, as early as seven years old. And the way that um, that youth are recruited most often in Trinidad is that um, they are given the task of holding guns and weapons because they're less likely to get a really strict sentence if they're caught because they're younger. So knowing that this is the, the sort of the initiation um, into that life um, and having that fact with me and seeing the reports worldwide of how many um, children are being killed and how many um, you know uh, civilians get, get caught in, in gang wars between um, not only gang wars, but also in violence involving police. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so police violence that affects urban youth. Um, there's a lot, just a lot of violence, a lot of, a lot of youth dying and a lot of people dying, a lot of black people dying either at the hands of police or the hands of, um, of people, other, other civilians who are carrying weapons and they get uh, caught in the crossfire. So one of the things that this movie examines is both of those um, tensions, you know, the, the role of the police in the communities and, and the roles of, um, of, of other civilians who are carrying weapons and, and how the youth get affected by it, um, you know, caught in the middle, so to speak. Awesome. So that, awesome. that's the pressing issue that we want to address with this movie. Awesome. Awesome. So um, Kev, I'll come back to you with this one. Not Kevin, sorry. Um, Wayne, 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 Wayne. I'll come back to you with the same question, Wayne. Mm -hmm. Every one of us, I mean, we're looking at our, I'm looking at the, 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 the characters and I'm looking at what it is that you guys are portraying here on the screen. And there is, yeah. you know, clearly there is the childhood that comes through, you know, yeah. but what is there that's going on now currently? you know, that is in the back of your brain as you work on this film? Well, you know, um, I'm, you know, like an Afro, I'm Afro-Jamaican and everything. So, uh, but, but like, uh, there's a, there's an African saying that say, you have to go back to your roots in order to move forward. You know, the Sankofa kind of thing. Sankofa bird, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I, I strongly believe in that kind of thing. So that's why um you know kids who are born outside jamaica with dry jamaican parents i ha i have a strong mission of like helping not only the kids but helping the parents remember their roots um mm -hmm. like i could go i could go a little bit further where i mean i mean i hear people that are from jamaican descent they have inheritance in jamaica i mean whether it may be land or property and they're like they, they're like whoa i don't want to go back to jamaica i'm going to sell out everything and go away I'm, uh, so, but but like, I, I want to um, bring a light to say, you know what? Yeah, you you were born outside Jamaica of Jamaican heritage, but like, come back and 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 help build Jamaica, or you know, invest in Jamaica. I mean, a lot of other nations are coming here who were who weren't 
born here, born in Jamaica or anything, but they, they're coming. So why can't um, uh, like the kids and the generation come back and do the same? Uh, so that's where, that's the story I'm actually pushing. And also like, it's also a two-sided story because like, I feel like once you take the plane on, the vibe I'm getting from Jamaicans is like, once I take the plane on, on it to Canada or the UK or Europe or whatnot, they don't treat you, they don't think you're much Jamaican anymore. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I get a lot. They don't think you're Jamaican anymore. And I, I'm reading it, where I'm reading these things, I'm reading it on forums. I'm reading it, again, with the Jamaican, like a football team, like a simple football team. It's kind of like, okay, if my kid is born in, um, in Canada, why can't he come back and represent Jamaica if he's good enough? You know, yeah. I'm not, not say like, whoa, this is Canadian kid, you know, you know, no, it's just like, if he's good enough and it's my kid, he's Jamaican roots, he should be able to represent Jamaica too, if he, if he choose to, opportunity yeah. to be there. Yeah. So I think a lot of the, yeah, go ahead. A lot of the, um, a lot of the folks that ha that stay on the outskirts and look in and don't want to come back, a lot of them don't want to do time information whether it be social media whether it be the new whatever it goes it's some information that they're getting so you know what it is that you guys are doing in terms of creating the kind of you know productions that shed a light on it so that they can like you said they can see that there is value in going back and there is value in representing you know as a president of the wrestling federation one of the ways that we have to get it started wrestling doesn't really happen on the island so what we have mm -hmm. to do first of all is try to find international athletes that were doing it that were of jamaican descent if we could find the ones that were direct jamaicans then we start yeah. with those and so the idea that we got um, a pushback on in the initial stage was that oh you're going to take all these foreigners and what happened to our locals but the intention yeah. for us was all right, so we don't have a thing going right now. So we're going to use the international athletes to get it going, to get some visibility, get some eyes on the sport, get some support for the sport. Then we can do a grassroots program where we can grow it out. You know, so sometimes I think it's, it's, it's really just the conversation. And so while a lot of people may not be able to have that conversation, you know, one-on-one, um, -on -one, I think it's beautiful when these kind of things can come out through our yeah. films and through our animations or whatever it is that people are watching. I think yes. whatever the message is that we want to share, you know, so kudos to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Especially from that angle. Yes, I, I definitely have to do it because um, it's kind of like we're all Jamaican, you know, um, whether, you know, it doesn't matter where you're born in the world, like you're Jamaican and um, you, you deserve to like know your roots and your upbringing and like, like Jamaican culture is beautiful. It's not just dance. It's not, it's music and it's not just one kind of music. You have mental, um, you have mental, you have ska, you have rock steady, you know, it's the food. Oh my God. Like the, 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 yeah. the, the, the I was even like, I remember when I was growing up in Clarendon, I was fascinated about the, the types of birds in Jamaica and those are just birds. And yep. I, I, the, the, the type of butterflies, and I could expand on it, and like you know the type of you know like I was so curious about the different type of butterfly that I see in Clarendon versus the one that I saw in Spanish Town, and I, I go into the library and look them up, and you know um, talk about the the beanie squid, the birds. Uh, I like, and you have the banana kitty, the one with the yellow yellow chest, and you have the robin, and uh, you know I was just fascinated by like. Jamaica is just so, it's just such a rich, uh, it's just like, yeah, there's a lot to learn. You know, it's so rich. Yeah, you know? indeed. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, again, that stood out in that interview for me um, with Tupac mm -hmm. is when he talked about just how rough his childhood was and how hard it was and how hard his mm -hmm. mom's childhood was and how hard his father's yeah. childhood was and, and all of these yeah. different things. But mm -hmm. at the same time, when he's taking a look at now and the possibilities that are ahead of him, he feels like he's so prepared. You know, yes. he hated that he had to go through those things, but he just feels like he's just ready for anything, you know, mm -hmm. um, based on his preparation. Yes. yes. So it's yeah. um, sometimes we want to, we have a tendency, 
to this one and not look back at and see the goodness that comes out of probably even some of the rough things that we went through growing up here. But there was so much that um, that's going on now that we're prepared for because of yeah. our upbringing. Yeah. So thanks for that. Um, Coretta, I'll come to you with the same question. You know, what's your um, what's your big go to? What's the thing that sits with you that you just feel like in some kind of way you want to make your mark or you want to make a difference? With? Um, how again, does that show up in um, your films? Men's mental health, just mental health in, in general. Um, uh, I mm -hmm. myself had struggles with, with mental health growing up and feelings of depression and, you know, negative ideations and that sort of thing. And then in talking about that and, and, and reading about it, realizing how much harder it is for men um, to talk about that, and, and especially like in the West Indies, in the, in the black communities, how difficult it is to speak about mental health and, you know, how to find a safe space to, to talk about that without getting judgment and also getting the support that that people need. And again, it, it's it's across the board, like men and women, but it's, it's very much harder for men. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is, I, I think the kind of, the kind of theme Kind of things that you guys are. Are you hearing him? Because I'm. No, I have to mute tonight because I can't leave with a double tone. Right. I don't know if Kevin's got dropped because I don't hear him anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not hearing him anymore. Yeah, he dropped up. There's a number of parts as well as his drop. Kevin, I don't know if you're hearing me, but I can't hear you at all. No, it looks like he dropped out, so oh, I'll no. just give him a minute. Sorry for this. Yeah. What was the essence? Because I wasn't. Mine was muted. What was um, he asking? Well, he was basically just, you know, on the tail end of what Coretta was saying, um, you know, highlighting the, the themes, um, I believe, especially the, the importance of the themes. Um, you know, in particular, one of the things that struck me with what Coretta just said was how hard it is for men to talk about, you know, mental illness um, because of the fear of judgment. And you know that's a very big deal in I think any any society in general, but definitely like amongst black men and in the Caribbean. And we see all of the weird, crazy things men are doing in the Caribbean. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have nobody to talk to. Um, and just in general, I'm pretty sure Kevin would say this. I think one of the things all of these projects is the fact that they all have strong themes they all have different themes but they all have strong themes they're not just animations about having fun and you know being a a, a quick gag there's something else behind them that's much more potent um tackling something in society uh, one of the things that i remember speaking to kathy about when asking her to come on this on board with this was that you know as much as there's this push for a lot of lead female content um, and that has to do with, you know, the, society. Oh, yeah, where, where, where society is at in other countries, you know, where women tend not to have much representation on screen. One of the problems Jamaica and the Caribbean faces is that we're losing a lot of our boys, you know, to crime, mental health, um, you know, a lot of things, a lot of them losing their principles and so on. And they don't have a lot of positive representation on screen. A lot, there's a lot of negative representation on screen, but not a lot of positive. And I, I can distinctly remember going to MIPCOM one year, and we went to the trailer. They had a trailer um, session where you're just watching trailers. Mm -hmm. And literally, out of all of the trailers we watched, there were only two trailers that had black people in it. One of us from Brazil, and all the black people were criminals. <clears throat> the one had one black person in it, and he was a chef. On, on a ship. And I just thought, this is why diversity yeah. is important. This, this is, is why right. representation is important. Because you can imagine growing up 
and that's what you see as male representation you know so uh, these projects are very exciting to me um, I guess the biggest question I'll fill in for Kevin in the meantime I would ask um, me ask Kathy this question since we just came off of Wayne and Coretta uh, what what's next for you with with Cabby Club you know like what are the in intentions for it how far along is uh, at this point in time So it's a it's a feature, and we just released the one minute teaser. Um, so uh, what I'm doing behind the scenes right now is working on making the rest of the, the feature. So um, the 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 Caddy Club is actually uh, hopefully the first of many features that are going to come out of Storyplay TV, which is a company that I founded that is um, intended to focus on. Uh, kids, Caribbean kids features, animated features. Um, and so what we were able to do through the work that we did to produce the minute of um, animation is we were able to test all of our numbers in terms of how much it's costing us to actually turn out this animation per second, per minute. And so now we're in a position where we're having conversations um, that can translate that knowledge that we've gotten in terms of how much it's costing us into um into conversations about funding and so we're having those types of exciting conversations and, and, and a lot of them have uh been since we since we now have the numbers to back up the projections the financial projections that we have a lot of those conversations are, are going from um, red to green and we're getting green lit with uh funding so um we are moving forward to produce the the, the full feature and then hopefully many features to come in the future Okay, great, great. So Wayne had to leave. Um, Kevin, just to fill you in, when you, you got caught off, basically, yes. um, I, I kind of tried to figure out what you were saying and just highlighting how important all of the different themes that are coming out of these animations are. Um, you know, starting with Coretta, since she was the last person you, you, you were mm -hmm. talking to about how important it is to, to highlight these mental health issues with men, especially the fact that they can't in a society where you know we have a lot of crime and we're losing a lot of men to crime and prison and so on and a lot of the times it just has to do with the fact that they don't have an avenue to express themselves express their pain express their hurt um and in fact i didn't mention this but i mentioned it no a lot of times they go to the gangs because that's where they get some form of acknowledgement of course. um you know some form of encouragement um yep. And, uh, you know, what we're, well, what I, I was highlighting how important it is to have positive representation of, of black men. Um, in, you know, right now, I know the rest of the world is pushing female con driven content because representation for, for, for women is generally low in a lot of uh, productions, right? Um, and when you do see women leading something, you know, a lot of times in the past, a lot of times, it tended to be along a, um, what you call it, very passive nature, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and now we're having more active female leads. But for the, for us in the Caribbean, our problem are men. The men don't have many positive role models. Um, and, you know, and I highlighted a situation where trailers and majority of the trailers, white people. And there were two trailers with black people, one from Brazil, all the black people were criminals, one of them. Another one, which was, I think, also from Brazil, there was one black person and he was a cook. So, so, you know, just highlighting how important the representation is and the fact that all of these representations are positive or tackling something um, serious. And then I asked Kathy to just tell us how far along her project is, um, you know, what her, what her plans are for the project. So that's when you came back in and you heard her speaking about how far along her project is. So I'm handing well, it back why over don't to you. Let's continue. Let's go through the round for a quick second. I'd love to hear the responses to your questions. <laughs> well, I mean, Kathy just went through what her where her project is at. Um, you know, she's gotten greenlit for funding. That's something that we rarely hear. 
mm -hmm. in the Caribbean mm -hmm. for any type of pro <laughs> creative project. Um, and so I'm going to follow up my question, Kathy, with how did you do it? Because oh, that's we're, still excellent to, we're still trying to unlock that magic. So um, it's partial funding. It doesn't cover the whole budget. And we're still in the process of, um, of doing the paperwork. So it isn't, um, the, the fat lady hasn't sung yet. So, I mean, don't, let's, but, but um, if we are to take the, um, the, verbal, the verbal commitment that the funders have made uh, seriously, which I do, um, it's in the process of, 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 um, of moving forward. And um, I, this is a conversation. This is a, a relationship that I've been nurturing for a while. It's 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 with a a, a, finan a financier who focuses specifically on um, media production and um, founded a company to finance projects in 2021. So since the then since the company was founded in 2021, I had already been working on the Caddy Club, and we we pretty much started talking right away and after all of those years of talking the financiers saw how how i was pushing forward the project independently and i was able to raise about 200k uh, tt dollars independently of them to move the, 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 the project forward uh through private sector public sector and through my own um investment in the project so seeing that i was able to reach raise 200,000 and Tobago dollars and seeing um, where I was able to take the project from concept to teaser trailer and um, even releasing a song teaser from the project because it's a musical and so I, I, I released a song teaser and the financier was able to listen to that as well. So they were able to see how through all of these years of talking to them, I was moving forward the project without waiting on them to green light anything. And so now that um, we're at this point where they're able to actually look at the teaser, the conversation that we're having is a little bit different because they feel a little bit more confident in my ability to finish this thing. And so um, I think that's how we were able to, to green light this additional partial funding that will take us to um, the next step. And it's, it's just the partial because we still have a lot of work to do to raise the rest of the money to finish the feature. But this partial funding will help us accomplish something um, that, would, that will definitely move the project forward significantly. So I'm very grateful. It sounds like the importance of the relationship while you were doing the project was um is a is a real one because a lot of the times you're working through a project you know you're going through the motions and you're caught up because you're the you're the brain you're everything into this project and you don't think all the time of the importance of keeping those relationships with possible funders or possible collaborators going as it is that you go to go through those projects that sounds like a great thing yeah, absolutely. Like I said, it wasn't it wasn't an immediate thing, you know. It was some years that we had been talking, and 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 it was once they were able to see, you know, how the project was shaping up. Yeah, that's what led to this. So who else is on the line? Still, I uh, said Wayne left, right? Correct. Right. Well, yeah, Wayne left. Yeah, Correct. Correct. So, ask you the same nice question. Your... No, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 you, you go ahead. That's exactly what I was going to say. So go ahead and yeah, ask. I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to get into the same question. I just want to know about the relationships in the sense that you build as you're developing these projects and, um, and just the patience and the importance of them. So I want to ask, the, Coretta, the same question is just like, how important is it? And uh, not coffee, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> I want to ask you the same yeah. question. It's like the kind of relationship that you have, you know, with your possible collaborators and donors to develop these projects and the importance of it. Yeah, it is incredibly, incredibly important. I'm literally just coming back from Annecy, France, um, where I attended the Annecy um, Film Festival. It's one of the biggest animation film festivals in the world. And it is such an important important thing to attend because it is where you get to meet people, you get to see projects, you get to see things that are coming from the same sort of background. You see, you see big film projects, you see film projects, but from independent people. 
and you're able to go there and talk to these people and, and, and find out, you know, how they got from point A to point B. You're able to meet these big producers. Uh, Guillermo del Toro was there, who was the uh, director of Pan's Labyrinth and most recently the Pinocchio um, stop motion movie that's on Netflix. And, you know, to see these people, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's important to see them. It's also important to walk around, ask questions and just develop relationships with people. I think that was the most important takeaway from that, that experience is just going there and nurturing genuine relationships with people. You're not just going there to go like, yo, I want something, give me this. You know, you really want to go there and nurture genuine relationships with people. It's very, very important. And to constantly attend these festivals and conventions year round uh, to maintain those relationships because you never know when. And I think that what Kathy was talking about, um, I, I believe there's a friend of mine who, who coined this this phrase, and he said it's. Well, he's, he's in here. He's yeah, in yeah, yeah, he's he's in there. there. Yes, he he says opportunity favors the prepared, and it's the whole thing of going ahead, doing your work, and then when that opportunity comes up, you have something to show, and that is very very vital. And I think that's um, paid off for Kathy quite a lot you know it's to continue to grow continue if you believe in the project enough to continue working on it independent of whether or not someone right now has interest in it and you never know where those those relationships are like you, you might show somebody something this year and go hey I'm here and then come back next year and go hey you know remember the same project I'm now at this stage and they're like Oh, interesting. So you are going forward with this, you know, and it, these are very, very, very important things. It was <laughs> oh, I think Kevin got dropped off again. Oh, oh no. All right. So let me, let me, let me talk then. Sorry guys, my, my, my computer moving slow. So when I click unmute, it takes a while to actually unmute. But Coretta touched on something that I don't think Kevin would have asked. So let me just jump into that. Um, what kind of festivals have you been to in the past? Um, and what would you recommend um, young animators to attend to foster these relationships? Um, I've um, been to Anime Caribe in Trinidad. I've been to Kid Screen in Miami. I've been to Lipcom in France, in Cannes. And I've been to the uh, the same one I just came back from, Annecy, in Annecy. <laughs> and I think that for, for young people, they all, and, and just to be clear, all these festivals and conferences have different themes. Um, MIPCOM and Kidscreen are a little bit more market-based, so you're kind of going there with the intention of selling something. You're going there with something to sell or to start a co-production. Um, with with Anime Caribe and Annecy, it's it's well. Let me start with Anime Caribe. Anime Caribe is more creative. Um, based, so it's more like you want to see what other animators in the region and also internationally are producing. And it is, I think that to me is very important for young animators to, to attend because, you know, you're working kind of as an animator, you're working behind a screen, you're, you're just kind of there zeroed in, you know, blinkers on by yourself and you, you don't really have an idea of what's going on out there. And when you attend these conferences or these festivals, you're able to see what others are putting out. And sometimes you look at your own work and go, all right, I'm happy with what I did, but I see things that are inspiring me to do even better. And then you come the following year with something that is better than you did the year before. And then you see something else and you go, that looks even better. I want to, as, I want to strive for that. And then this is how you, you grow as an animator. Um, for, for Annecy, it is, it's a little bit of both. It is the, the creative side and it is also a bit of the business side. 
but in terms of Alice, it feels a little bit more like it's a little bit more laid back. You you're going maybe to talk to people about the potential of something happening, but it's, it's mostly to make those to garner those relationships to say hey you know what have you guys done this year oh i see you guys have a project hey you know maybe i could help with that project or maybe i could come on to that project or maybe you guys can work on my project sort of a thing it's, it's a real showcase of where the industry is because all of the big players are there and you kind of get this really great idea of what studios are coming out with where the trends are going. And these are very, very important things to attend. So what Thank you for that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 Kevin. I was just, I was just actually following up on a question with Coretta. Um, just letting, asking her um, what festivals or what conferences she would recommend. So I'm not stepping on your toes. I just wanted to <laughs> let you know that's what the question was. <laughs> Da, 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 you can continue, da, da. Kevin. <laughs> no, I, I was just wondering in terms of what keeps you guys on 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 target, because in in um in the dance hall industry, for example, you know you know that you want to be in the music industry, you want to be a cultural artist, or you want to make a difference, you want to come out and sing all the right lyrics, but at the same time, the world is not buying your audience, is not buying that, you know. So how do you stick to your guns and follow through? With what it is that through that's truly your passion or do you sometimes have to you know moonlight a little bit and do some other things and how do you how do you stay on track okay. I, look what i want you to um so it's it's for me it's a combination of in, my internal belief in the vision not just for the project, but my vision for Storyplay TV as a film company. But also every now and again, you pop out and you do some tests, right? So I've taken um, the Caddy Club into classrooms and um, I've watched how uh, six-year-olds respond to it. Um, I've taken it to play dates when I have a daughter. So, you know, when she has play dates, she's eight now. And since, she's, since she was six, five, you know, um, all of the play dates, they see the little posters and the little art that has come out. They see the trailer. So I've taken it into spaces, um, you know, informally and formally. And the kids love it. They love it. They love it. The excitement in the room when they see these, this art and the, and the media is tangible. And then when they find out that the Caddy Club is a team of superheroes, from Trinidad, from the Caribbean, from an island just like them, it's just like, oh, what? They literally are like, when can I watch this? Before there was anything to watch, they were trying to click on the poster to watch the poster. You know, these kids yeah. are <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So they, they, they're touching yeah. the screen, like, how, why, why isn't that working, auntie? Like this, this, this thing you know, that you're trying to show me, why is not playing? So that is that that feeds me because it, it lets me know that I'm doing something that has demand and it has real demand, not just in my head, you know, because over uh, over 45 kids told me unanimously that they want to see this movie. Um, so that plus my internal motivation keeps me going. Awesome. Coretta. Um, for me, it's it's really just this the drive to tell the stories that I've had in my head ever since I was like a kid. Like I was, I lived in my head a lot and I had all these weird characters and stories and I really want to share that with the world. And yeah, sometimes, you know, that stuff doesn't necessarily make you the money right off the bat. There mm -hmm. is what I, what I do to make money on the side is work on commercials. And that's kind of how I get my income and then I work on my personal stuff you know, one always, but it, it's always been very interesting for me that the work I do on commercials is so uh, different from the work that I do for myself, because right. more often than not, I'll not be able to utilize the full extent of my skill set on a mm -hmm. commercial locally. So I have to be creating things for myself to say, this is what I can do. And this is these are the stories that I want I want to tell. Um, so yeah, it, it really is this, this very internal 
this, this thing that's just here, like I have to do it. It's, you know, it, it's a compulsion to do it. Um, I feel like if I, I didn't do it, I'd just go mad or something. <laughs> but um, also knowing that there's a, there's an audience for whatever story that you are telling. Sometimes you may not find, you may not know the audience right away, but you tell a story and then you'll find that audience. That audience will be there. You'll never know until somewhere down the line, somebody will go, oh, hey, I like, I like this story. Um, for example, with Taylor Shadows, um, I had kind of kept it to myself, and it was when they had King's, yeah, King's, King's Tomb. Tomb. I keep what? getting confused with Kid Screen. King's Tomb, 2016, I entered it. And it was uh, really in interesting to see the reaction when people saw it, people watched it, and you know, how they reacted to it. I'd like to interject. I'd like to interject. I'd like you to tell the whole story. Did you, did you enter it willingly or did you have to be coaxed into it? And, and did you get a best friend um, <laughs> because of said incident? Oh my God. I may have destroyed a chair. No, I was already destroyed. I was clutching on it. Um, no, I didn't enter willingly. Um, I had people. Um, I need to fix things. Yeah. Anyway, um, I didn't enter willingly. I, I was uh, coaxed uh, a lot. I I think I entered like about 15 minutes before Kate Stone closed for submissions. And I was just like, ah, nobody wants to watch this. And um, yeah, I ended up winning <laughs> that year. And it was amazing to see the feedback from people and, and see the way they reacted to the characters. A, a lot of women were uh, enthralled by Boris slash the Forest Guardian. Because I had this 3D printed model. I should have brought it with me. I had, this, uh, I had this 3D printed model and everybody was like swarming towards me going, I want to take pictures with Boris. And it was, it was such an interesting, intriguing uh just uh, experience, and, and that was the sort of thing that kind of made me go, oh yeah, so okay, I'm, I'm doing these things in the privacy of my, my bedroom, at, at home, in my lair, but there are people that want to see the stories that uh, that I, I have to tell, so yeah. Oh yeah, all the judges. Best oh. friend, you still haven't said how you got a best friend. Fine. <laughs> so, the judges, there were seven judges, um, and they, like six of them, absolutely uh, hated. I wouldn't say hated, but they, they, the criticism was that Tale of Shadows was too dark and scary for kids. And I was kind of feeling very dejected. At that point, I was like, yeah, I know I'm not winning this because, you know, of the feedback that I was getting. And I was feeling pretty um, bummed out because I was like, see, this is why I didn't want to enter this. And there was one guy from Spain, his name was Antonio Morales. I'll never forget him. We got to him and he says, everybody says it's too dark, I love it. You don't change a thing, you leave it exactly the way that it is. Children love to be scared. And I, <laughs> and I was like, I thought to myself in that moment, there was this aha moment where it was like culture and where you come from in the world really does determine um, the kinds of things that you find yourself attracted to. Because you, you have someone that, that comes from a culture where their stories are a little bit darker and different. And then they see this story that I'm telling and they, they, they absolutely find themselves drawn to it. Whereas from another culture, from like a US where they're used to, t to telling more, you know, happy-go-lucky little sugary, sugar-coated stories. Yeah. It's like, you know, they, they probably look at it and go, nah. Um, and this is why probably for me, Guillermo del Toro is probably one of my, uh, one, one of my, I don't want to say heroes, I don't, I don't like elevating people to that, to that level, but someone I, I look up to in terms of how he thinks about storytelling and how he sees animation as cinema and not just as entertainment for children. So, yeah. Did we lose coffee too? Yeah. Me talking too much? Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm here, I'm here. Ah, Kathy has returned. Okay, excellent, perfect. All right, we're gonna stop right there.
Oh, oh no, wait. I didn't talk about how I got the best friend. There you go. Yes. I'm sorry. That was the last part of the question. So I, I won a, a Cintiq. I won two Cintiqs for that um, that win at, at King's Tune. And, and, you know, I suddenly had a, a best friend out of nowhere because she's like you have two cintiqs why why do you need two you don't need two. i had to, suddenly you know i just you know you don't got, need to i got a, a best friend <laughs> over there who's like suddenly hey my my bestie <laughs> so okay we're gonna stop right there let me just jump in i just wanted to plug um the b2b meetings at anime Caribbean. <laughs> just in connection to um, uh, Shabaness's question about festivals. And I believe uh, Kevin was also asking a bit about um, like financially, how does the juggle work in terms of staying, the commi staying committed to the projects that I'm working on? And um, Anime Caribe uh, has uh, B2B opportunities at least they have for the last few years. It may be a fairly new thing. And those have been really productive for me. I've gotten uh, screenwriting gigs through that, through those B2Bs. I've met with, um, you know, uh, international animation companies. I've got hired directors to work on shows through those. And, um, you know, that's as an independent that, that money, especially when you look at that conversion rate of US or, or Canadian dollars. It's, it's it, it gives you enough um, to actually get quite a bit of runway. Sorry, Kathy. Sorry, Kathy. I don't mean to interrupt you. Shireen, can you mute your microphone for me, please? Muchas gracias. Kathy can continue. That's it. I'm done. That's it. Just pick up Anime Caribe B2B. But in terms of just, um, let's talk about just the world and how it is that your art oh. kind of brings back to some of the, the stuff that's going on and whether that, that is important to you. So some people will decide and say, boy, again, the world is going through a lot of things. And yes, my voice could make a difference, but I'm not making any money, you know, doing it or getting into the polit not necessarily getting into the political arena, but just putting your yourself out there is this something that you guys have um that is in your decision making when it is that you're gonna get into a project does it have to have a social impact kind of feel does it have to have you know anything or you know what what do you look for in a project what makes a good project coffee let me start with you for me, it has to be that intersection of impact and profitability. If I can see an opportunity to make money and I can see an opportunity to really touch on some, in a very real way, touch on some sort of, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily issue, but uh, in something of impact, you know, even if it isn't a problem but it's an opportunity because it mightn't be a problem but there's some opportunity to, to make life better to make my community better to uplift people it has to be that intersection and if i don't see both i'll i i i, I have turned projects down because i don't see both there you know understood uh for me it's it's about just utilizing the platform of animation to tell a story. And then within that framework, you're able to, to make an impact by highlighting whatever issue it is that particular story is, is about. And I think for me, that's, that's the driving force of it. Um, in terms of, like I said, the, the money aspect for me is, it, like I said, they, I use the commercials to sort of um, make money for myself. Um, I haven't actually, well, the, the great thing about also doing doing like my short films before, um, going back to before the um, 
the film that I'm working on now, the short films that I've done previously, in entering them into film festivals, you do have the opportunity to win and get cash. That is one of that is you know one of the things. Um, I I mean for me, I'm not acting. I, I don't want to act like I don't need money, but <laughs> money is not never never been the main driving force for me. It's always been about the telling the story and getting that across. I think that you know there's this this idea of my stories will outlive me. Um, you know, I, the, the material stuff I will come. Um, I can't take the material things with me, but my stories will last beyond me. And that's kind of like, you know, I realize if I don't tell the stories now, they go away with me. So that's kind of been my, my thought process. Got it. It's, um, it's it's commendable because in every industry right now, it's almost like there's a social angle. You know, it's not good enough just to be about your your art or your um, <clears throat> your craft anymore. There is a part of us that's realized that the world is now it's it's it it's it requires all of us. It requires an input you know, from all of us. So it's, um, it's amazing to see, you know, in animation, but how do you keep that going, especially when it's like, are, is it easier, is it harder to do it with animation than it would be just to a regular, regular um, film, a regular uh, video making? I, I don't know that it's necessarily easier. It's just the, um the platform that I choose to use. I know that for filmmakers, they would say that whatever medium they're using would be the preferred method to get across whatever stories they want to tell. For me, it's just animation. Got it. And Kofi, what's your opinion on that? Do you feel safer, the fact that you can tell the stories from you know the animation standpoint or you know using real characters? Does that make a difference? I don't think so. Not, not in my perspective. The the spirit of the thing is always more important than the actual um, physical medium. So I right. think what is animation, live action, music, whatever, as it's the spirit that you put into it, as opposed to the the material thing. Why did you choose animation? For me, animation actually came out. Um, so there, there was a genuine, a genuine love for the art form, yeah. But I was also, uh, and then I was surrounded by people, you know, in my, in my uh, immediately, immediate collaborative circle who were also interested in animation. But then there was a third thing that was really influential, which is when I first started working on my first animated short, Big Man's Anne. I had just had my daughter. I was a full-time um, full time, uh, entrepreneur, part-time lecturer, and a full-time mother who was, you know, nursing at home, and I needed a lot of home time. Live action productions would have taken me away from her too much. And with uh, animation, I was able to, you know, literally be nursing her while having, um, while making assets or, you know, moving forward with the production because everything is digital. So it was really friendly with remote work even prior to COVID. And then once COVID hit, the fact that it, I was already working in a remote environment was very useful for, for advancing the project. So that because animation is so remote work friendly and also it, it, it lends itself better to the way that we've been moving the project forward um, into, into in, 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 what am I trying to say? Sporadically or not sporadically, in interstitials, like in, in, in spurts. So, um, you know, there'll be a spurt of, of funding, we'll move forward and then have to stop. In live action, that would be a huge continuity nightmare because everything would change the next time that you go out to start shooting, right? But because we're working with digital assets, they don't, they don't change while they're in that cloud storage or on that drive. They, they stay fresh, they stay new, they stay evergreen. And so we can start and stop without absolutely um, messing up the whole production. And so that has worked really well in terms of the way that we're raising funding as well. 
So for all those reasons, animation um, is a good fit. And then it also, um, you know, it speaks to kids. It speaks to kids loud and and clear, and and they gravitate towards it. So it's a it's it's a good fit for all those reasons. Awesome, Corinne. I'll ask you the same question. Why did you choose animation, or did animation choose you? I, I've I've always wanted to do animation ever since I was a kid and. I, I would draw a lot and I knew that animation was the thing that I wanted to do more than anything else in the world. And, and I don't know, I, I guess it was the best medium to create the characters, like I said, um, that I had in my head and share them with, with others. Um, it, it's a little bit harder to do in live action. I, I, I don't know how you're going to find an actual troll ogre dude to, uh, <laughs> to be in your film. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's always been a bit animation for me. And, and I think that what's interesting, even, even though I work in animation mostly, I do also work alongside the film industry in Jamaica in terms of doing VFX for live action films. Um, you'll just find that different mediums lend themselves better to telling certain types of stories. Um, for me, it's just always been animation. I, like it's, it's just magic to me. And I just, I, you know, I just, I love it. And if it is that you were given, I don't know, given instructions to a, a group of someone that was kind of on the fence, you know, um, someone wanting to tell stories. Are they telling, what, what, what would be the reasons, you know, that you would give them to choose animation? I would uh, what think would they that- What to make you want to direct them in that direction? I, I, my idea is not to force someone to do something they don't want to do. You know, right. I think that it's important to encourage people to tell stories in the way that feels most comfortable to them. Um, I, if I see someone with the that has a propensity to look towards drawing or creating in that sort of way, that I'd be like, yes, you know, I think animation is is right for you. Um, and I, I kind of try to encourage people in the direction they want to go because about it, it's about expression for themselves and the stories they want to tell. Um, and again, even though I do 3D mostly, if somebody, say, for example, wants to do 2D animation, I don't turn them away from that. You know, it's it's their truth. And I want them to express themselves in the, the best way possible that is, that is true to them and their story and their experiences. So why would you, for example, choose 2D over 3D? <sighs> Depends on this on the story. Again, for me, I mostly move with with three D because I just like the technical aspect of it. I feel it's this great marriage of of art and technology that sort of ticks all the right boxes in, in my brain for me. Um, and for two D animation, it is way more like create. Yes, there is the technical side in terms of like getting something to move correctly and understanding movement. Um, it is a little bit more creative in terms of like you have to be really on point with your, your art and how you are able to interpret your character through that medium. Um, you know, I, like, I don't have a, I never pick one over the other. I like, for me, it's whichever one serves best to tell the story. For example, if you look at the animation industry now, a lot of the big movies are all in 3D. And, you know, sometimes I, I lament the days of, you know, I go back and I say, oh, I don't really do 2D stuff anymore. There's something, there's something different about 2D that 3D can't fully capture. I think that, like, for example, Spider-Verse is a very good example of, like, them trying to marry those two things together where it's not just f straight 3D, you're, you're tying in all these different art forms and, and graphical elements and um, 2D elements into, into something to make it look very unique. But it's, it's about finding that thing that tells the story best. Understood. I am, <clears throat> I'm always amazed as just uh, how do you move 
from something just being a hobby, something being that you really like, to having that thing become in a career? How do you make that transition? And how did you guys make the transition from it just being something that you really like to do to, to where you are with it now? Kathy, I'll start with you. Very slowly. <laughs> very slowly. So, but how um, did you know? When did you know? And how did you know I that know. this is something that you wanted you know to make what? a career out of? You know what? I I knew I wanted to make a career out of making movies for sure since at least 2000, uh, 2007. By 2007, I was sure that I wanted to make a career out of making movies, but I wasn't able to actually make any money from um, anything remotely connected to the media industry until maybe 2008 or so, 2009, I think I would have gotten my first paycheck from a media industry job. And then it wasn't directly in movies, it was an interactive media, you know? And I was still trying to make my way into movies. And then I did a master's program learning how to screenwrite. And again, uh, my, my, my checks were coming from, uh, you know, uh, online media. And um, I wasn't until, when did I make my first check from a, like a, a fiction movie project? Um, yeah, it, would been a, it would have been around the time of, uh, let's see, 2000. A, a lot of the work that I would, would have been doing would have been um, to, to build my experience up without making a real money from it until Big Man Dan. Big Man Dan would have been the first project where I actually was earning income from making movies. But Big Man Dan was released in 2019. I started working on it in 2015. I made this decision in 2007. Do you see what I mean? So the trajectory was very slow and I was doing a lot of other types of jobs while I wasn't giving up and still working on honing my skills, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it took a while for me to go from, I want to do this to I am doing this. And it's about seven years, about seven wow. years. Yeah. Awesome. And so where are you with your decision now? Are you so happy where I with your decision? I am. I am very happy with my decision because now I'm in a position as an entrepreneur too mm -hmm. to see um, to see the long term gains of what this is going to be able to 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 do for me and my life. You know, so in the short term, I'm proud of the fact that I can make the day to day work, but the making the day to day work isn't the end goal. So the day to day, you know, that's a that's a success in an, in and of itself, but it's not really mm -hmm. the goal. You know, it should just mm -hmm. be able to. To, to have that uh, substance of okay, month to month, I could I could live. You want a little bit more than that, right? And so now I'm at the stage where I can see the value that this IP could create long term when we release it, and the knowledge set that it's going to give my business to release other films, and you know, to to possibly even sell the, the business in the future. Like you know, mm -hmm. there's there's I, I see very very real um, economic potential from it and so as an entrepreneur the economic side of it excites me and then the artistic side of it excites me as an artist where I can see that you know I have a I have a medium to get these stories out there to make an impact to you know to to entertain kids yep. and families so I'm very happy with that decision and it has even inspired me to to get back to some of my other art forms like music and you know it it's been so in, inspiring that it's it's given me courage to do to go back to my other artistic endeavors as well. Awesome. Awesome. It's good to have found a way. So again, your advice to young people who are going through it in the middle of it and you know just don't really see it just yet. What's the advice is just to keep on moving on because you started yeah. in 2007, but never got paid until 2019. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And I had, I was doing all sorts of other work and it was still, I, I was still lucky enough to be in the industry. And I think that's, that's a, that's a big uh, sort of takeaway. I think there's the industry is huge, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about the animation industry and the entertainment industry in itself, it's a big industry. There are so many ways to get in. 
that it doesn't have to be literally that your first job, like maybe your dream is to be an animation director, an animator, but your first job might be in something that's, um, you know, on the distribution side, or it might be on the fundraising side, but you're inside. That's the point. You're in, <laughs> right? You're learning, you're absorbing, and yeah. you're going to start. You, you, before you know it, you have learned so much about this industry and eventually you'll be able to get to what you want to be doing, you know? So um, definitely don't give up. Awesome. Corinna, I'll ask you the same question. Um, which, which, which one of the questions, the very, very last questions? Just the whole idea of uh, moving it from, okay. you know, how do you go from it yes. being a hobby, something that you like and having it be the thing that um, you used to earn? Great. So, so this was very, very important to me. And, and um, I did art in high school. And what I learned in dealing with the educational system is that we don't see art as something that is useful. We see it as strictly a hobby. Mm -hmm. I always knew the potential that art had in all these different industries, fashion design, industrial design, architecture, animation, graphic design, movies, all of this. I, I knew that from, you know, I was in high school and I, you know, I knew how I could um, apply the skill set. And I remember when I graduated, when I, I did my, oh God, which one is it? CXE? I did CXE. And I wanted to continue doing my, my art. And when I went back to my school and I said, hey, I want to do art for six forms. Like, why do you want to do that? So art isn't important. And I was like, what? <laughs> they actually tried to thwart the art program for the, for the, the sixth form because I had to go find my art teacher. And he was like, what is she talking about? We are doing art for sixth form, we're open. And the, the other thing is people assume that art is this easy thing to do. Um, we started off doing our uh, A-level art with seven students. And by the time we were done, there's only two of us left because people started to realize it was a work. And it was myself and one other girl. And I, I knew that if I just stuck to it and I took it step by step, I would get to where I wanted to be. Um, out of high school, one of the first jobs I got was illustrating for the teenage at the uh, Jamaica Observer. They had this section in the newspaper called the Teenage Magazine and I was doing illustrations for them. And it was just slowly going from that to graphic design to then on to animation. Like one of the hard things was back then when I said I wanted to do animation, it was such an alien concept that people would just look at me going, so an animation on a picnic table, you know? And I was like, yeah, but adults make animation. It's not a bunch of 10 year olds <laughs> sitting down. <laughs> They're grown old men making animation. So this has been, this is a business. This is something I realized. And I think for me, I was like always the nerd watching the behind the scenes stuff. So I could see this industry from, from behind the scenes and, and what it took. And I, I knew this was something that once I stuck to it and took my time, I'd eventually get in. And it takes a lot of perseverance when, especially when you get the pushback from society um, as a whole in terms of like, animation or creativity or anything to do with art not being financially viable it is quite viable so and when you take lucrative. a when you take a look at just the different industries and all that kind of stuff um the different things that are going on again worldwide and all these how do you then put the importance of let's get back to the whole idea of just having the male image so say at the right now, everything about man seems to be not so great. So what is the importance of projecting that male um, image in your, in your productions? Strong male image. Uh, so specifically me? Or yeah, let's start with you. I'll go to coffee as well. Okay. All right. Um, for me, it's, I get it. It's, you, you hear all these negative things, but it's also important to find yourself around people who are who have, are positive role models. 
are finding yourself in the company of people who kind of go against the grain and the stereotype that, that you are used to hearing about men. You, you, you find yourself around men who will talk about their feelings, who are open, who you know do not just resort to violence as the first reaction to something that will talk and think things out. And you start to realize, huh, these these men exist, and they need to be they need to be highlighted more. They need to be to be out there. So you know, in terms of that, it's like you know, surrounding myself with with positive male role models and just men in general. And again, um, I I've mentioned this before about meeting my father and realizing that he's really a cool dude. Like, you know, I could talk with him about things and, and he's so open with his feelings and with his emotions. He's not afraid to hide if he, if he if he cries about something, he doesn't hide that from anybody. And I thought that was really meaningful and something I'm like, well, you know, if I get a chance to, to make a male character, I'd like to put these these sorts of things into that character. Awesome. Kathy, I'll ask you the same question. What's the importance of, you know, just projecting the male images in, in your production for you? Yeah, so in, in both Big Band Dan and the Caddy Club, um, the males are co-leads. They're leading strong individuals but they very much, their roles and their stories exist alongside women. And I think that's important for me um, because, um, you know, when we think of, 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 of things like, uh, you know, giving positive examples for young boys and for, for all of us to see, I think part of what makes a, a strong leading man in the real world for me is his ability to occupy space alongside where it's not necessarily subordination or a situation of dominance where there's mutual respect. Because one of the reasons that we have this big push for female leads is because um, you know, traditionally um, women have experienced a lot of a lot of disenfranchisement, and we and 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 a lot of us feel like it has been at the hands of you know the patriarchy, the men holding us down, and um, it could it, it would be so easy for us to just do what has been done to us, which is just to erase the other gender completely. But I think one of the things that makes women better than men is that we're able to make space <laughs> for others, right? And that we have this natural ability to give everybody a voice at the table and not exclude. Some, you know, so um, so I, you know, the 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 young, the strong boys in the caddy club answer to a captain, a superhero captain. That's a woman. The captain of the superhero team is a woman, but they are leaders in and of themselves. They each have unique virtues that they bring to the forefront to lead in their in as as a member of the team, but in their own lives as well. And so, you know, it- I want to. Huh? Now I was just going to ask, is it important to you that the, the female has feminine characteristics and is not competing with that male, so she has Absolutely. to look like a man type superhero with yes. the muscles and stuff just like, you know, how, when I take a look at your, the image of that big giant with that little girl in his hand, she's, she's nothing like him in a sense. She's just completely opposite and sometimes in our world, that seems to be a thing is like we're competing with each other to take up the space that we naturally occupy. So that was good to see. Coretta. Yeah, it dropped a little bit for me. Uh, Could you repeat? Just in terms of the images, you know that right. I'm, I'm taking a look at the images that you create in, ter- in, in, right. in your animation, the male, the male figure, and then right. their counterparts. Is it important that the counterparts show the same kind of strength? Or are you, you know, what are you trying to, 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 to get across here? Um, I mean, in, in real life, you end up with women in situations that sometimes they don't ask for. Um, women have to sort of take on roles that aren't that there's no one there to fulfill those roles and in 
my stories, I kind of want to be as authentic as possible. It, it mm-hmm. would be nice for women to just be women and for men to just occupy their space and there's not that, that pushback. But in terms of our history, yeah, in, in our history, especially, you know, coming back from slavery days and all that thing about, you know, women having to, you know, take up roles that men had occupied, whether or not those men left voluntarily, but more than likely they were taken away, enslaved and all of that stuff. And women were now forced to take up things that they didn't necessarily ask for. Um, and some people, some women are going to naturally find themselves wanting to be more feminine. And some women are just going to be in a situation where it's like, all right, no, there's not a man around. Let me just take up what's that. Let's, let me just get, get stuff done. And it's not necessarily that you're trying to. I have. I can I'm not sure. I think. Okay. There she oh, is. something. Did it drop? Okay. It's acknowledging that there is a wide. There's there's a wide sort of representation. There isn't just a black and white sort of representation there and acknowledging that it is part of reality and then also reflecting that in my work. You know, Kathy, you said something earlier on where you spoke about the whole idea of not just taking a look at how the the man, the male superhero shows up, but how he shows up with his counterpart. How does he show up when, you know, there's a, a woman in the picture, what kind of image is he displaying? And projecting at that point in time, why why is that um, why is that of importance? I think uh, you you said it you sort of hinted at it when you uh, you talked about okay um, you know not not necessarily losing the feminine or the masculine, but but coexisting you know like I, I I'm thinking of that yin yang symbol mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. has that you know kind of like thing that that is like two two parts that 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 form a whole um different but balancing off each other yes equally so involved perfect. exactly i think that's really important because i think that is um that's for me that's like one of the missing keys in our community because of some of the things that uh that coretta would have started to talk about we, we do have some reparations to do in our community when it comes to our relationship with each other uh, men and women it's not completely our fault it was deliberate right our 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 units were deliberately separated from each other and traumatized in front of each other to make us fight in situations where we should be united, right? Um, and so I think part of our reparation is to bring back that unity, bring back that balance in a more consistent basis where we recognize that we are two parts of a whole, even at the young tender age of the Caddy Club, we we can coexist and work together and, and you can act, occupy your masculine and 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 she can occupy her feminine and you can both come together and save the world you know understood so where's uh coretta I, hey coretta <clears throat> So again, the 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 whole idea of of yours um, being the a group setting. How do you how do you go about, you know, deciding, for example, which one of the characters, you know, um, is in a sense in the lead? How do you choose a lead character? Um, in a group setting, is that that, a cast your terms. cast but, your cast right um so i have most of the, the main cast of my thing is uh sort of supernatural creatures um say hold on bring my the question again because i was like this, I, I just they're, they're supernatural <laughs> creatures but yeah, yeah, i'm just talking right. about from the perspective of when you have a cast that is 
okay, you know, okay. male right. and female and all that kind of stuff. All right, right, you know, right. and at the same um, time, you want to just tell your story, but do you at the same time you're you're, all right, right. you're cognizant of the images that are out there and how it is that right, our men right. are portrayed and blah, you know, all these different kind of stuff. So, how do you make the decision in terms of how you position your characters then? And so who do you choose as the you know, interestingly, um, for mine, it, it's the two main characters are the uh, forest guardian and the little girl. Those are the two main characters. But then the story, when you're writing a story, the question is, whose story really is it? Who is the character that undergoes the most change? And right. you know, that's the person whose story it is. And mm -hmm. it really, I started to realize it was really the forest guardian story it was his story he was the one that was you know had the most struggle and needed the most change to kind of you know become the person he wanted to be and um in terms of when you start writing the story and start to figure out you know where, where the flow where you wanted to end up you start to realize okay you can see how the characters play off of each other how they they and they encourage um the forward movement of the story and, and and how they interact with each other in that in that way um so once i started to look into that who's going through the most change thing it was easy to start to say all right it is his story mostly um but everybody's story is everybody has their own little thing kind of every, every character has their own little arc that is happening kind of at the same time and you kind of want to write in a way where their arcs work with each other they help to push the, the story forward um and there's always going to be those moments where it's going to be this one character's moment to shine or another character's moment to shine or two characters together in terms of like you know how their personalities play off of each other and i think that is uh, that's very very important and coffee my question to you is uh what makes a compelling uh <clears throat> an animation you know compelling in terms of you know you being the the person you want to bring something to your audience what it, you know how do you make that happen what makes it compelling uh any what makes any animation compelling uh what makes your animation compelling oh, oh, okay um It's hmm, a good question. What makes it compelling? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, we're telling stories, you know, we're mm -hmm. telling stories. And so um, I think uh, well told, relatable stories that take you through an emotional journey are what makes, what draws people in, you know? Um, so the emotions that the characters go through in both Big Man Dan and um, the Caddy Club. Uh, as, as well as the, the fact that um, I think audiences, specifically West Indian audiences in both Big Man Dan and the Caddy Club, they are going to see themselves in the worlds of these of these animated shows, you know? So you, the, the power in recognizing yourself on screen and saying, yep, that's me. I know that world. I know those people. I know that place. I think that makes it very compelling as well. Awesome. Coretta, what makes your uh, production compelling? Authenticity. Uh, and I think it's just in, in any, for anyone telling a story, I think authenticity is incredibly important that you are being honest with yourself and the story that you're telling, um, being honest with your experiences, being honest about the kinds of characters that you are, are writing. Um, and when you are your authentic self, you you will create a product that people will find themselves drawn to rather than you trying to be something or someone that you are not and it again this was something that i i learned from going to annecy in one of the sessions that i attended they were like be your authentic self because that way you attract people who will who resonate most with what you are what you are telling and what you are creating when you try to to cram yourself into a place where you don't really belong in terms of like, oh, well, maybe if I do this, maybe people will like me. It, 
people can pick up on that lack of authenticity and they'll just be like, yeah, something just kind of feel off. But when you are your true, authentic self, I think that makes anything that you are working on the creation compelling. Understood. <clears throat> so now that you're at this point, you know, with your careers, you're at this point with your films, that kind of thing. Do you feel like it's a responsibility that you have? Um, again, understanding, you know, what men go through as it relates to mental health, understanding what men go through in terms of being able to express themselves in a particular way. Do you take it on to yourself, you know, as you express yourself through your, your productions, that there's a need um, for the, the, the strong, the male image, or is it just something that if it comes up and you can put it in, you put it in, but it's not a driver for you? How important is it for you to put strong male images out there, or, you know, is it just something that um, if it shows up, it shows up? I think that for, for me, as an animator, you're going to write different characters. You you are going to, some one day it's going to be uh, a, a little girl, it's going to be a monster dude, it's going to be a, a robot, it's going to be an alien. And, and really, you are trying to write the, the best, most authentic character that you can write. And if it happens to be, you, you want to do right by that character and you want to do right by what what you're trying to use that character to tell. So when, once you have a female character, it's like, all right, how can I do right by this character in terms of what story I want to tell through her as a vehicle? And when it comes to a male character, how can I do right by this character and, and tell, use this character as a vehicle to tell what, whatever story or, or whatever issues, um, whatever message is out there. Um, and, and that's kind of the way that it is for me. It's like, I, I, it's about the character first and then trying to do right by that character. I think that I'm not necessarily particularly either or. I, I'm not looking for just male characters, just female characters. It's just characters. You, you just want to do right by the characters that, that you create. Okay. Coffee? Where are you at with that? Are you looking when you make when you come into uh, productions coming together? You know, are you seeing, you know, where you need to put in this character because you see what's going on in society? Are you just doing your work and if it shows up, it shows up? I think so far, I don't know, I don't know how my I don't know how my career will evolve, but so far in the two productions that I have worked on, it has been very intentional to want to examine that whole idea of masculinity and femininity and um and and um i do i do you know when when kevin was uh inviting me to join this discussion this meeting i i do see an importance of having of, of counteracting actively counteracting the many years and years and years of work that have gone into showing a very a uh, small representation of black men and black women, right? So, and then the thing about as a, as a mother and a woman, I know that it's not just for boys that we need strong male representation. It's very important for my little girl to see positive mm -hmm. male role models. I know that firsthand. It's very important for me as a woman to see examples of positive um, masculinity and to not be surrounded by toxic examples constantly, right? It's, it's something yeah. that I crave for myself and my daughter, not just for the boys and men in my life. So because I'm so passionate about it and because of my history of losing my father to gun violence and police violence, I think I will always actively want to see positive role models for, for everyone that are uh, men and women, but, but boys will always have, boys and men will always have a special place in my heart. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's amazing that sometimes we have these conversations and we don't see it again. We don't see it as how the two works together. The man needs the woman, the woman needs the man. And what you said earlier on about just how 
it's important not just for the man to show up, but how does he show up beside his, his woman or, the, or his partner or his, his daughter or, you know, how does he show up when there's a woman in the picture? That is very important. And so the whole idea, again, of um, that we're not trying to, to get this conversation going just for our own sake. I mean, uh, for the male's sake, and this is a man's problem and they need to fix their issues. You know, it's all of us because we're partners. It's um, <clears throat> a very powerful thing happened here in Jamaica back in, um, back in, in a few years when Michael Manley was the prime minister of the country. Um, I think it was Henry was Kissinger who was the secretary of state for the US that had called and they were thinking that Michael Manley was going to go the Cuban way and, and, and they wanted more something that were, you know, more their direction. So they wanted to come down and have a conversation with him. So they called him up and they say, look, Michael, uh, we're coming, I'm coming to Jamaica and I'd love to meet you. I'm going to be in Montego Bay in a couple of weeks. And um, yeah, he had the conversation, then he had several conversations around his office, you know, trying to set up this meeting to meet Kissinger um, in Montego Bay. And um, everybody's in agreement, he made the decisions. And then finally he's at home and he's about to go to bed and he's laying in bed with his wife and they're, you know, they're, you know, you pillow talk, you're just having conversations before you fall asleep. And he said, well, by the way, you know, I'm going now to, to Montego Bay to meet with Kissinger in a, in a week or so. And she goes, Montego Bay? Why would you go to Montego Bay to meet Kissinger? Well, he says, that's where his hotel is, he's staying in the hotel down there or whatever. And she said, like, are you crazy? You're the prime minister of the country. Let him come and visit you in Jamaica House. Why would you go to a hotel to meet him? You're a... And so... I'm just talking about the importance of all the different men that he would have spoken to while he made the decision to actually go ahead and we sometimes don't understand the importance of those decisions that made that are made when two heads are on the pillow or when two, you know, a couple is is together. It's very important. So a lot of the times you think it's women, women this, and we think it's men, men this. And when you really dig down and you see who makes the decisions, it's usually a, a two-way thing. You know, to be able to see these images and, and again, you know, just the approach of not only showing strong male figures on in these animations, but also show them standing beside their counterparts. I think it's a very, very powerful thing. So, um, so yeah, I just, uh, I, I, the animation world is is brand new to me in the sense of any kind of behind the scenes i've seen a ton of them and i've enjoyed them immensely but in terms of just what just what goes into creating one that tells a good story especially you know these days when we want to see strong male presence you know so to be able to create you know animation animated characters you know that's that tells that story and again one of the powerful things i'll walk away from this gathering today with it's not just only how a man shows up strong by himself, but how does he show up, you know, um, with his partner in the space. So, Kevin, Kevin Jackson. Yes, yes sir. sir, I am yes, here. Yes, sir. I am not sure where you want me to go with the rest of, of the, um, of the oh. evening. But I figure it would be a good time for me to have you interject and maybe just give us some directions in how you'd like to. to well, yeah, man, no problem. I mean, good timing, good timing. I'm going to hand it over to, to Chevy. Uh, in the meantime, let me just share a screen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I had to ask Kevin to share a screen because my machine was moving slow. 
And now Kevin is starting to share his screen and his machine has started to move slow. Maybe it's the share screen operation, God he knows. Well, first and foremost, I want to I want to thank everyone. I want to thank first Kevin Wallen um, for taking this plunge because I specifically asked him, I said, listen, I wanted someone who was not influenced by the animation industry to moderate this talk. And he decided, he's like, for animation, no, 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 animation, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and he, he, he took the plunge nonetheless. And I think he did a fantastic job. Kevin, thank you so much for, you know, moderating this talk. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and then I want to thank our panelists, even though Wayne had to leave. Um, I want to thank Wayne, um, Coretta, Kaffee. Um, for me, my main takeaway was that it's yin, yin and yang. Yin and yang. Yin yang. Yin yang. Yin yang. Yin yang. Yin yang. <laughs> <laughs> it's it takes two to tango yeah. tango tango that's the that's the phrase right um for me as well telling stories that are from your life and and personal to you that's what drives you to continue um i can say this from experience even though my daughter is giving a shade for this um we started so kevin jackson and i started an animated series and that was a million years ago and my daughter watched watched the first episode in 2017 and she just she just keeps throwing shade at us now saying oh so i tell her about a student and, she, and she'd be like i hope i hope they finish the project unlike unlike a beacon in maroons you know <laughs> <laughs> my daughter throws a lot of shade um so, <laughs> so I can just imagine again, the trials and tribulations that all of you are going through. I mean, Kathy told us that she started on something from 20, 2007 mm -hmm. and, you know, still pushing through. So it's, it's not just, it's not just enough to tell a story that you're passionate about, but you need to have the dexterity to follow through despite persons telling you six out of seven persons telling you this is too dark you know <laughs> despite just having a child and still having to push through you know being an entrepreneur being a new mom and a creative you know you still have to push through and get your vision out there and it's not that they've reached anywhere yet guys right can we not see on the tv yet yeah yes. not yet However, um, the journey is still there, and that's what I like. And, you know, overall, let us just know that, you know, when we're writing these stories that, you know, yes, there is a push internationally for female leads and female-driven content, but, you know, there is a place for male-driven content and male stories nonetheless, right? And I still want to see some man a shut, shut up some man. Like, I like to see that, no? <laughs> but want to see the big muscle lemon and then, you know, no? Okay, fine, fine, fine. I will behave. So. <laughs> I don't know this person. <laughs> so Kevin, you can advance. So thank you. And I also want to thank um, you all for, for attending. But let's just talk a little bit more about the Jamaica Animation Nation Network. So we have, as I was saying to you before, we have some activity, not necessarily a meeting, but we have an activity each month, um, the last Saturday of each month. And next month is going to be an amazing month. If you've never been to Anime Come, please, 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 you need to attend Anime Come next, next month. It's July 29 to 30. Um, so it's both Saturday and Sunday. You can pay for your ticket either for Saturday only, Sunday only. It's two days. Oh, Kevin is no, like, no, it's two it's, days. No, I was it's it's like in the 29th versus 28th on the calendar. Oh, in the rest of it, then that was my mistake. Oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. Right? So it's two days. And um, 
you can also pay a ticket for the both days, right? Uh, the tickets are available online and they also have places that you can go to and purchase a physical ticket if you want to purchase a physical ticket. I strongly recommend um, following AnimeCom. I'm going to type it in the chat now. Their Instagram page is AnimeComFest at AnimeComFest. And uh oh, I just. I just sent it to Kevin only and not to everyone. <laughs> oh my goodness. Right? So it's Anime Come Fest. Um, follow them on Instagram and then you find out the information about the vendors, where you can get tickets, who will be presenting. They have a cosplay competition. Mm -hmm. uh, and the cosplay competition. There's a cosplay competition for Anime Picnic, right? And that's usually earlier in the year but the cosplay competition at anime come ton opeth right <laughs> it ton opeth it do be ton Ke kevin what's the name of that gentleman that always he there's a gentleman that comes he did he did um he was an alien from alien oh yeah, yeah i remember him right he was no cyber from Mortal Kombat. He from Mortal Kombat. He's we've we've had some really interesting characters. So trust me, guys. CBA Chinese Benevolent Association, um, July 29th and 30th, or is it 28th and 29th? Oh, 29th and 30th. You need to be there, right? Get a ticket now. If you are a member of Jan, that is there's a 50% discount. Um, to all paid up members. You notice how I just said that? Kevin is not going to do it, right? And the other executive <laughs> members, but I have no shame. So I'm just going to say, if you don't pay on the money, you're not going to get the 50% discount, right? So if you're a paid up member, you can get 50% discount on your anime come ticket. However, let's say you haven't been a member. Um, you've been a subscriber all this time. No problem. At Anime Com, so you pay to enter into Anime Com. You can find the Jan booth, and we're doing a special for membership: one thousand Jamaican dollars. Everybody heard that? One thousand Jamaican dollars for membership up to December 2023. You want to capitalize on this special, guys? Trust me. Typically, um, if you're a student, a tertiary level student. It would have been two thousand five hundred dollars a membership. If you're a freelancer or a studio, the lowest price is three thousand Jamaican dollars. So you're getting a significant discount if you come to Anime Com. So that's my suggestion. Kevin, advance the slide for me, please. And as you can see, we have some other events there um, for you to check out. Now, every Sunday at four p.m., we um, we have art and chill and it's it's a space an online space created to help you to create one of the problems that we have is that we get distracted easily distracted and so we don't complete our personal projects so we invite you to come into our discord space and um create and it doesn't matter what it is because most times i find persons don't join art and chill because they go but I don't have a project to work on right now. So it, it don't make any sense I go to Art and Chill. You have homework I do? You're a student and you have homework I do? Come to Art and Chill. You're an entrepreneur and you need to write up your business plan? Come to Art and Chill. You're an illustrator and you need to get some illustrating done? Come to... Everybody getting the, the picture? Once you want a little dedicated time and you want to be around persons, like-minded people, in a space that is going to help push you forward, come to Art and Chill, and that's every Sunday at 4 p.m. All right, um, what else about Jan? No, we are the only part things, you know. <laughs> if you have not been a subscriber, so let's say you're not a member and you haven't been subscribed to us, so you don't know everything that we are doing, here you go. Now, um, one of the things that we're passionate about is David Martin. He is... He has been an influencer in the Jamaican animation industry for a long time. And he actually also went to St. Vincent. <laughs> Vincent. <laughs> I, always, I always get it wrong. Um, and the Grenadines? Yes. Right. 
um he went to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and he um with the mission of starting up the animation industry there so he's not just an influencer in the Jamaican animation industry he's an influencer in the Caribbean animation industry and about two years ago two years ago he got a stroke so, yeah. about two years ago he got a stroke and um out of that from that stroke um he's developed some complications and now needs to do surgery so we've been doing a drive um for persons to donate to him um it's millions of dollars no joke guys he has to do bypass surgery heart surgery Ooh. and then after the surgery he has to do he has to pay for the recovery as well and during all of that time he won't be working right and he has family and children so it's, it's a lot of money yeah. that is needed to help him to be out of work for that period mm -hmm. to do the surgery to recover properly right and then now be able to contribute again to the industry so please any every mickle make a muckle and he has multiple ways in which you can donate to him um so if you haven't been following us you just follow any one of us at any one of our spaces and you'll get the information there um we are also calling for trailers or any content so earlier coretta had told you about you know, the many places that she's been to, Kids Screen and Annecy and Mipcom and, um, I don't know, Anime Carib, right? Um, and the same cafe she told us about Anime Carib and some other yeah. festivals, right? No, not everyone is able to do that journey. Ah, thousands of US dollars to go to France, yeah. right? <laughs> The airfare, mm. the hotel fear, the mm. ground transportation. Mm. And I don't know, can't feed me because my belly ever long. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the food bill, you know, all of that costs thousands of US dollars, right? And so not everyone will be able to go to all of these festivals. So what we are doing here at Jan is to assist you that even though you won't be there physically, you still be your production, whatever it is that you are creating, will be there. Um, so we are on a mission. Um, September we are heading to the Ottawa International, International Animation. Animation Festival, and that will be September. And in, ad in addition to our efforts, that's Jan's efforts, the Film Commissioner at JamPro also tours the world to let persons know about what Jamaica can do in film, music, and animation. So what you want to do as Doyen, Doyen less, so we can't even take a stab at him now, but as Doyen always says, opportunity favors the prepared, right? So what you need to be doing is working on your productions and it doesn't matter what it is. So we said trailers, but it's really anything. So if you have a pitch Bible, send us your pitch Bible. If you have a trailer, send us a trailer. If you have a proof of concept. So while Coretta, while Coretta was talking, you saw a proof of concept for Taylor, Shadows. Taylor Shadows. I knew that. And, <laughs> and Kathy, you saw a proof of concept from Kathy when um, for Cabby, I almost Caddy. said Caddy. Caddy. I almost said Cabby Chronicles, you know, Jesus, Caddy, Caddy Club, <laughs> Caddy Club right? Um, so if you have a proof of concept, pitch Bible, um trailer whatever it is that you have even if it's the, the the pitch bible would have illustrations give us what you have so that when we go to these different festivals you're there you never know you might get a deal with a nickelodeon or uh netflix or whatever and even if it doesn't necessarily have to be those big companies either you have smaller entities as well who are looking for productions and they're hungry for they're hungry for content from the caribbean Right. Um, right. Immediately after this, we are going to be launching a call for um, presenters for our teaching creative courses symposium. Um, so we want persons to present on different things that they think needs to be heard about teaching creative courses. Um, 
so often teachers are alone. We do what we do by ourselves, right? <laughs> and it's not supposed to be that way. It needs to be a community. And so um, we want to hear from the teachers, what, what are you doing in your classroom? Is there something that you're doing that you're connecting with your students? Let us know. So when we send out this call out, respond to the call out so that we can have this symposium with interesting information that other teachers want to know. And then the last thing I'll talk about is our animation industry survey. This one is very, very important. Whether you're a member of Jan or not, whether you are, and, or even if you don't intend to be a member of Jan, right? Um, you need to participate. Whether you're a teacher, a student, a freelancer, somebody who owns a studio, you need to participate. Whether you live in Jamaica or you don't live in Jamaica, you need to participate. If you have anything to do with the Jamaican animation industry, so like for instance, you're born somewhere else, I'm I'm throwing my eyes at at Coretta right now. You guys not I, seeing I me. I feel like <laughs> I feel like someone's trying to throw shade on me. So whether you're born somewhere else and you are operating in the Jamaican animation industry, or you were born in Jamaica and you left and you are operating in another industry. We still need to hear your feedback. And then of course, importantly, if you're born here and you're working here, we also need to hear your voice, right? So everyone needs to participate in this, in this study. This is what we're going to be able to know. Use as leverage when Kevin, as our president, goes to all of these companies and these government institute, government entities, and say, "Hey, we want, we want some money. We want this. We want that." They're gonna be like, oh, "But your industry not have nobody." And Kevin now can just roll out the survey and go, "No, no, no, no. See what my people are saying here. This is what they want. This is the, this is, this is where they're coming from. These are some of the issues that they're going through. We're not gonna know." until you tell us, so tell us. And that's why this animation industry survey is so important. So it's going to be, the survey is gonna end the end of July. So you need to make sure that you participate in that as soon as possible. You can advance this like Kevin. We soon done man, me hear some, I hear some people sending me some telepathic messages. We we'll soon finish. All right, Um. no, so you can't copy it. If you're in present of you, it's in the it's in the it's in the notes for the slides. So there is a Jan meeting satisfaction survey that we always ask anyone who is in attendance. And so we're just gonna ask you if you can fill out this survey right now. So Kevin is in search of the link. <laughs> and as soon as and as soon as Kevin finds it, we're going to post it in the chat. It's in the notes. Give me a second. It's because I decided not to be from my side. Oh, yeah, right All right, stop sharing. No, not, don't stop share. Just exit the presentation. So, mm -hmm. And then now click back on present. Present, present a view. Uh, and present. And you should get it in all the notes. To full screen for that one. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, I'm going to click on the other one. Yeah, see there. Oh. Oh, thank God, me and Kevin in the same location together. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kevin is copying the link now and he's going to post it in the chat. I'm just going to ask you if you can just participate in that and just let us know. So, next slide now, Kevin. So, there is a difference between being a subscriber to Jan and being a member of Jan. So you can subscribe to us and you can follow us on our many platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, um, Twitter, and you know you don't have to pay anything um, and you can keep up to date with limited information. Or you can become a member and that gives you access to additional things. So right now, um, our members are able to, as I said before, get the 50% discount um, to Anime Come. And in addition, we partnered with Stage 32 
for five waivers um, for the remind me the new name. voices in animation script writing competition. New voices in animation script writing competition. We, the, Kevin, being the amazing person that he is, reached out to Stage Thirty Two and said, and basically juked down the people him and said, <laughs> "Give me five waivers." And they were like, "All right, fine. We hear about Jamaica. All right, cool, 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 cool. We give you the five waivers them." And he got the five waivers right all for our members so <laughs> as a member you can tap into additional benefits when i said that we are going around to the different locations the different festivals to try and promote you this is open up to our members so you need to become a member in order to tap into additional um benefits all right next one and then the next slide is just all about where you can find us the many many places that you can find us so we have a website, animationjamaica.com, and that's where you go to actually sign up to be a member. You just go to the website, top right-hand corner, you say join, you fill out this form, and then you have to, at some point, send out the proof of payment, email us the proof of payment, um, and then we'll take it from there. We have a Discord community, and in the Discord community, we have some challenges in there that you can participate in. We have art and chill in there and other things that you can venture. Facebook, we have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. I personally would tell you, join the Facebook group. There are so many students, there are so many freelancers that are looking for partners and you don't know where to go and find a partner to help you with your production, right? The Facebook group is a nice place to go and um, meet people, see what people are working on. You know, Even if it's a work in progress, post what you have so you can get feedback and critique from your community, right? And I know Facebook is an old people space, right? But um, what I find is that it's really good at bringing people together. And that's the reason why I endorse the Facebook group. Instagram, once you want to know what we're doing, you can follow us on Instagram. Same thing for LinkedIn and Twitter. And we have a YouTube channel um, that we have content on. And those trailers that we're asking for, you know, sometimes they might they might end up on the YouTube channels because we're trying to do promotions for you. Kevin, you can advance. And I think there's just one last thing. So I just want to thank you all for coming out and taking the time to you know just listen to this talk leading male talk and um commune you know it's all about fellowship animation it's so easy for us to be in a silo and by ourselves um, we need spaces like this we need events like this to bring us out so that we can commune and so that's another thing that we like to do at the end of our meetings is to encourage networking. So, you know, connect with somebody. Right now we have people in the chat. I think I know everybody in the chat, so <laughs> let me call out some people. That's the favorite part, right? Everybody loves it when I do this, when I call out people, right? So Jace Cover, right? You might read it and think it's cover but no it's cover is his man name he's an exceptional Hello. 3d animator <laughs> right so that's jace i think jojo is joel mcfarlane who Yo! is yes who is an incredible 2d animator and she, she can do 3d too you know but you go on like she don't know about 3d 3d right <laughs> see no she's not Right? I did. I don't know. I don't know every port, porter, or probably I do, but I can't remember just yet. So forgive me, Evroy. Um, Evroy, uh, go again. I thought Evroy 3D. Oh, so Evroy, you, you taught him at VTDI? Uh, no, virtual workforce night. Oh, Jace, me never know say I do all sorts of something, man. See, this is why you need to talk to people so you know them business. I mean, so that you can network. <laughs> Al Jay is one of my students that has just completed his amazing production. Al Jay, you need to start doing the circuit. Um, the name of your production is what again, Al Jay? 
dare to dream. See him not even talk, him not even want to unmute. Hey, miss. Um, good evening, everyone. Yeah, it's dare to dream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's an animation about this guy in a, named Aaron who is in a nine-to-five job that he doesn't want to be in. So he basically becomes inspired and pushes past it and tries to become an artist. And when you oh, we'll have to watch the final sorry. happens, but yeah. And I am sure when we do the call for content, LJ is gonna respond because at Anime Come, Jan is all a showcase of films. So LJ, you're going to respond, yes. LJ is going to be at Anime Come, yes. And if you want to see LJ's production, you too will have to be at Anime Come to see what Dare to Dream is about. Thank you for volunteering, LJ. And, Boy. And, and yeah, oh, yes, we're also going to have um, Karma at Night at um, Gatfest. And Gatfest is on. Karma at Night for Gatfest will be on June 30th. But I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think I submitted Dare to Dream. Oh, Dare to Dream is that funny? Mm -mm. Oh. But, but productions like, let me see if I can remember Joel McFarlane's name of her production. Hmm. I know, I know, I know I have some past students where <laughs> Joel is, Jojo is like, what? All right. I see Gash Hoods. Is that Gashwin by any Gashwin, chance? Yeah. That's Gashwin. Oh. Pleasure joining out here. No problem. Yes, Link with Cafe. Gashwin. Last year had launched his comic book, his hardcover comic book. It is amazing. Please. And he did so at Anime Com. Um, please, please make sure that you link Gashwain. So private message him right now and say Gash Gash Hoods. Gashwain. Um oh, Hoods. Hoods. Hoods, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Obviously, certain things are on my mind. Anywho, Anywho. so <laughs> So um, send him a private message, right? And say, how much for your, for, your, for your comic? And, you know, when can I link you so that I can make a purchase of that, you know, that book? Justin is, is in Canada and making some waves in Canada, but I don't know what you've done recently, Justin, so we can't big you up, Justin. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, man, we're hearing you. Yeah, so I was at Brown Bag Films. Um, and we just wrapped up the new season of Wildcats. I don't know if you know Wildcats. Ooh. Mm. Ooh, nice. nice. Right. So that's what I worked on recently. Um, I'm still looking for a new contract, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's it, that's it with me. I, before that, I worked on a show called Saga Mini Friends. That's on nice. TV. So. Uh, yeah, I've worked on about two shows since I've been here. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Justin. And yeah. yes, interesting. All right. Now, I am going to spill the beans with regards to Kemar Mechanis because Kemar never tells us what is going on with him. So, Kemar, <laughs> Kemar sorry, not sorry, but I'm going to bust upon you. Kemar, if, if anybody knows, Kemar has been ritualistically releasing um, instructional videos on how to use Blender. Everybody, yes? And, um, and oh yes, and Synfig, right? That's what Kemar has been doing for years. Out of that activity, is who link you know Kemar to ask you to do some online courses? Come on, Kemar, I've, I've set it up. You just need to tell us. All right, so let me trip in here. It's four o'clock, and I believe the meeting is from one to four. You know, and I know that everybody is busy, so I don't want to keep you guys. Come on, tell us who. Thank you guys for coming. Right? Hmm? Jesus. I have no I idea what to go, I swear, I swear, I swear. Come on, I, I'm not, I'm not in the meeting until we talk about. Well, let's talk about Kemar. Me soon, me soon, me soon, boss you. It's all right. It was you, Demi, I'm sure. It's you, Demi, reached out to Kemar. Not Kemar reached out to you. 
the Amen. man the man get hot that know him get him get recruited Amen. right well it's, it's not it's not you Debbie. it's another you <laughs> but it's not it's not them I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's one that offers nano degrees. I don't remember. Just send a man came here, Jesus. We can't Udacity. leave with so much. Udacity. Udacity. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much, Kemar. Jesus. I feel like I had a pull one teeth a while ago. Right? Um, Peter and... No. Shireen, I don't know where you're up to now, you know, so you have to, you have to type in the chat. Although I noticed Shireen has been posted in the chat a lot. Peter Ann is an illustrator. Wait a moment, I say what Shireen is. Shireen is a 3D animator and storyteller. Lord, I hope I said the right thing. And Peter Ann is an illustrator. 2D animation. Thanks, Shireen. And Peter Ann is an illustrator. Um, and book illustrator. I don't know who Philip is, and they're the last person on the list. Is this Philip from Homes Media? I'm sorry, Philip. Yes, we're hearing. I guess maybe Philip is in Toronto. All right, no problem. So that's it. Um, I hope you guys yes, have been Philip private messaging. Media. Oh, oh, it is Philip from from Homes Media. Okay. One second, Jojo's question before I wrap up. All right, let me go in the chat and see what Jojo's question was. What? So we, what oh doing? yeah, what do I do? Yes. everybody business. Yeah, me just teach and I teach the. BFA. And I win an award and all these things. I won a so, teaching so award. award them. Oh, yeah. Teach award. Uh, see how life goes. <laughs> see how you got to touch the own medicine now. <laughs> okay, fine. Yes. I teach animation. Um, I'm here with the Jan executive body to help push animation. And, um, <laughs> oh my God. And yes, I won. I won an award. I won't say a big award, but I won an award in regards to teaching. So yes, thanks for that, Jojo. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you guys have been private messaging each other and sharing each other's contacts so that, you know, you never know out of this meeting, we could have an even more amazing collaboration happening and even better content happening. Can I say one more um, thing in closing? Yeah, man, that's fine. Excellent. So I, I, um, I had a good friend, he passed away a few years ago, Ruben Hurricane Carter. Um, if you've seen the movie Hurricane, Denzel Washington played mm -hmm. him in that movie. Oh. The, oh. the book Ooh. that they used to create that movie, he and I sat in his basement for a couple of weeks and he read that thing to me. It's the only copy of his voice in that kind of setting anywhere. And I've been trying to wow. figure out what to do with it. And I think, I don't know, maybe this it might be- the best arena. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a great I reader. Like he's very animated in terms of how it is that he presents it. And I just think the world, you know, would be, um, would still be interested in hearing In the his story. Voice. Yeah, but and, hearing and it hearing from it him. In his voice, yes. Okay, we should talk, we should talk. Yes. So Kevin, and that is Kevin Wallen, you're yes. going to get a deeper dive into the animation industry. Take a look at that. <laughs> Take a look at that. So, so thanks again for the advice. Yeah, man, that's no problem. That's no problem. That's what we are in. The last N is network. That's what we do, networking as well. Awesome. All right. So I know Kevin Jackson is going to reach out to you. But if anyone else wants to reach out, you know, private message Kevin um, while in your contact information so that you can keep the conversation going. We're going to leave the session open for five more minutes. No talking or anything. Just allow for persons to exchange contact information. And by 4, 10 p.m., the session will be closed. So you're not going to hear any more talking from me. Um, stay safe, everyone. And thank you for joining.
Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye, man. Keep Bye. hydrated. Keep cool. Bye.